Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. It's great to see you. Happy Sunday night. It's a weird night. I know it's a weird night and I'm weird. I am sick. I'm not even going to try to hide it. I'm super sick, but it's time for our crossword night. And how, how could I miss, how could I miss our second ever crossword night? Really? So I, I will get as far as I can get. I think we'll get to the, I am a hot mess. But I'll tell you what, I'm a hot mess, but I was in the studio today killing it, getting those advent calendars out. I, time tied and uh, trolley waits for no man. Okay, that's the trivia question of the night. Do you know what movie that is from? Tied, 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 time and trolley waits for no man. We, we but I'll give you a hint. We busted into our collection of Christmas movies this weekend. It was my mom's birthday weekend. And um, that was one of the ones we watched. Linda, great to see you from Ch It is chilly. It is super chilly. I'm soaking wet to boot. I was like spl splashing myself with toothpaste to try to look uh, normal. Normal. It is chilly out here. It got cold fast, but man, I'll take it. I'm just waiting for the snow to come. We, are, we have the sleds and we are ready to go. Let's see all four seasons this year. Let's see if we can make it happen. Kirsten, cheers, my dears in Vermont. I saw you left me a message. I have to check it out. Kirsten put up a post showing like your, 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 um, printing, like your, my brain is not working well today. Notebooks and cards, like beautiful paper products of the cats of the infamous cats. And they are so lovely. So be sure that you look at the Facebook group. Our Facebook group is called rug cooking and punch needle club and, um, check them out. They are really beautiful. And Kirsten, you did a beautiful video to promote them. I love that. I love that. Melissa, great to see you. Hello from Cozy Sackville. Oh, I bet it is super cozy there. Charlotte, great to see you. Happy Sunday night. Carol, Carol, I think that's you. Isn't that you, Carol? <laughs> it's great to see you. And my buddy, great to see you. Hello from Dover. Happy Thanksgiving. It is Thanksgiving week for us in the U.S. It's coming really fast. Teddy literally just said to me, how long before the Thanksgiving break? And I said, well, you're in school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then that is it. So let me just, um, let me just scroll. Okay. Just scrolling down. I just want to be sure you can hear me because, um, Streamlabs reset gave me, gave me a couple of gifts recently with new versions that required me like spending quite a bit of time cleaning out my computer. Isn't that, isn't that a thing? Isn't that a thing that they would expect you to stop what you're doing and put like a ridiculous amount of time into cleaning your laptop so that they can give you an update that you didn't ask for and would prefer not to have. Amazing, isn't it? Life is just amazing. Linda H. Cheers, my dears in Massachusetts. I bet it's chilly where you are too. Valerie, great to see you. Hello there in Rehoboth Beach. Great to see you. Happy Sunday night. Happy crossword night, everybody. Cats Gallery, cheers, my dears. Great to see you. Gail, good morning in Australia. Great to see you. Ryan, I hope you got my message. It's not gallery night yet, but I have that beautiful piece that you sent me locked up for the next gallery night. Absolutely beautiful. Cheers, my dears. Happy Sunday night. Cocktails and pasta for your birthday, Eve. Already? I feel like it was just your birthday. Isn't... I just hate how time goes by. It's getting to be... Um, like, What's that called when you have a phobia about time passing? It is a thing. I saw it on that TV show, Jonathan Creek, right? That great mystery show. I feel like I'm starting to get that. I get like such a pang every time someone says it's it's like your birthday coming up and I'm thinking... It just was your, it was your birthday like two weeks ago. How can that possibly be? And yet it is. Judy, great to see you. Happy almost birthday to Ryan. That's right. Happy almost birthday. And Kirsten says, you'll also post it. So post the link to the products that, that Kirsten has now available. They are super beautiful, like journals, perfect for this time of year too. Cards, right? That you could send out holiday cards and things like that. Beautiful paper products. Sometimes we just have too much rug stuff for this moment, or you're backed up with uh, projects, but you're thinking, oh, I'd like to shop a little and see what's there. Well, here's a great chance to have something different because these are the patterns that are also uh, rug hooking patterns, but um, in different form. So that's really fun, really fun and ingenious. So beautiful too. Lori, great to see you. Happy Sunday. Great to see you. Fernanda, great to see you. Hello in New Brunswick. Great to see you. Happy Sunday. Yep, that's you. Charlotte is my is your first name, but I use Carol more. That happens a lot, doesn't it? 
And Gail says, happy, happy early birthday to you, Ryan. It's a great birthday time of year, isn't it? Um, sh a sure thing, Kirsten, always. It is a big birthday time. My mother's birthday was this week, so um, we celebrated. My sister and I went and celebrated with her. We went up to the big E fairgrounds and um, uh, inside, inside. And um, yeah, there was a Christmas market, which was really nice. And, um, you know, I didn't know... <clears throat> I didn't know what kind of stalls there would be. I mean, I've never been to a Christmas market. They didn't use the word expo. I'm a little bit adverse to the word expo, but like festival and market are, are good for me. I was just thinking, you know, there's going to be like hundreds of vendors there. And I was just there for the fiber festival. And I thought, well, since it's my mom's birthday weekend and it's really close to her and then we can go to the little tavern that's right there, very historic and pretty. I thought this could be like the very thing. So my sister and I went and brought her, and it was one of those things. I was saying to Kirsten when I left a message a little while ago, I said, you know, it was one of those things that was like, you know, there were some very nice vendors there. Like my friend um, Angelina Flory was there again with her needle felting, um, you know, three-dimensional animals and holiday stuff. So beautiful. I got some um, some beautiful, like, folky, handmade, um, like, folk sculpture stuffed stuff for the mantle at work. Uh, you'll see I, I'm working on redoing the mantle, turning it over from Halloween to holiday. So I got stuff like that. So there were like, you know, there were very expensive jewelry stalls. Um, I got a beautiful knitted poncho, uh, quite a few people who are knitting finished goods. Um, nobody selling yarn or supplies. It was just finished goods. Lots of food things like chutney and different kinds of peanut butter. And I got those balls that are like, um, you put them in hot water and it's it's already cocoa with marshmallows in it. Like, for the kids stocking stuff like that I thought okay good um, so it was like it was partly food um, it was like partly very very fine artisan stuff and it was partly guys who were standing around going like do you need your gutter cleaned you know like service services and it's like hmm what do you mean by that is that a metaphor for something <laughs> So I mean, because I, I was not feeling well and my brain was not working, but it was a lot of people wanting to clean my gutter and a lot of people who were selling very good things and, and some people who were selling things that were like imported, thing, which is totally fine, but it's not what I expect at an artisan craft market. But 90% of it was fantastic. So there you go. I love to hear about markets all through the year. I love to find opportunities to find stalls and sellers. God, I'm going to have to show you on the show this one woman. This is nothing to do with fiber. She was collecting. Do you remember how it was like this style in like the 1950s to wear a cardigan, but to put like two um, buttony things, clips on the sides of the cardigan that had like a chain that connected them? This woman was making three different products that that like blew my mind. One of them was that, you know, because it's not so much for me the style of doing the 1950s cardigan thing. It's that I've gotten too fat to wear my clothing. So like something that doesn't close anymore, I would like a very nice chain, like connecting that right there. So connect the dots. But so I got one of those and, and everything that she made, she's making it out of old jewelry and pins and things like that. She's repurposing like we repurpose. And man, it was like unlimited. She just had like uh, so much stock out and then so much more. She took out probably another 20 or 30 boxes of stuff for us because I was like, do you have any geometrics? And I was being very annoying, I'm sure. We bought a lot of stuff. These things, right, that clip your shirt together. But you can also put on a scarf, like just a scarf, you know, just a straight rectangular one, and you can clip it across. So it almost becomes like a shawl because the clips are really strong, right? They're really strong. And I mean, you could like tow my car with one of these little clips. They're like really strong. But you could have on just a normal scarf and then just have the thing across and there's no way it's going to go anywhere. And I thought, oh, this is very, very good. She sold those and she sold um, scarf clips, right? Because I'm not a big scarf wearer because with my crazy OCD, I can't ever get it wrapped right. And it's like this tail's hanging out a little too much and this one's way off to the side and, and it drives me nuts. So I tend to not wear scarves, although I have many and I love them. Well, this thing is like a button or a vintage pin or something that she found. And she, she must have glued, like crazy glue, um, two pins on the back of each one, but facing opposite ways, right? Like one little head is here, one, so that, so that you can grab one thing here and one thing there. And they're just beautiful. They were like, there were some Christmas trees. There were, there was thousands of every kind of design. She had a whole box of just owls, you know, and some were like Halloween. 
it was unbelievable. And the third product that she did, I think this is all really, ah, really got me. It, she, again, had like old pins and old things that she'd taken off of necklaces and dismantled. And it was all vintagey, like Bakelite stuff too. And their scarf um, ties. So what it is, is like this pretty pin, each one unique. And on the back, it's almost like an elastic band, but with a toggle. So you get your scarf the way, I can't really do it with my Kleenex, but you get it the way that you want it, just the way that you want it. And then the scarf thing can't go through it like a napkin holder. It won't work like that, right? Because it's already around your head. But it opens on the toggle. So you undo it and then it has two distinct ends and then you wrap it around with the pin facing out, however, wherever you have it. And then you toggle it in the back and it stays put. These were remarkable things, I'll tell you. Um, Christmas stockings are gonna be good this year. That's all I can say, but it was a lot of fun. I always like seeing interesting things like that. And, and I said to her, do you have like a website? And she said, well, no, because everything I do is completely unique. Like if I use that pin, right? If this is like the pin, one of the children's uh, Halloween scorpions, once it's sold, it's sold and there's no point in listing it because then it's not there anymore. So I said, ah, I see how it is. Cause I obviously am going to be um, running, running very dry on these scarf clips probably sooner rather than later. And I'm gonna need to hunt her down. But luckily a lot of these, a lot of these vendors do lots of different fairs and so many great ideas out there, you know, so many great ideas. So anyway, I hope that your weekend was a lot of fun too. Um, if you're typing in the thread, I'll follow it and see what you all were up to. Just projecting forward to this week, which is Thanksgiving week, right before we start our crossword, um, which maybe you filled in a little. And if you haven't, no problem. If you haven't downloaded it to do the crossword, no problem. It'll just be like a little trivia night for you tonight, a little rug cooking trivia night. Also fantastic, and I have lots of slides. It's a beautiful slideshow too. So even if you haven't done the crossword, you're fine. It's just for fun, right? And if you did do the crossword and you really enjoyed it, this is the second crossword night that we've had. The first, well, this one was called Rugger's Riddle, and the first one was called Rug Hooker's Puzzle. And they're both on Ribbon Candy Hooking, the website, and they're both free downloads. And this video we're about to record, we're in the process of recording, is the second one, um, Rugger's Riddle. But the first one has its own gallery night under the name of Rug Hooker's Puzzle, and it's the first crossword night. So if you enjoyed this, you could download the second one, do the crossword, and then uh, look up that video from a couple of months ago, and you could have another fun night of filling out a crossword. So, um, so let's talk about this week. This is Thanksgiving week here. I already know I'm going to not run coffee time um, tomorrow because I have a super sore throat. I'm loaded with medicine right now. I'm drinking tea. I'm good. I, I feel like I haven't seen you in forever and I haven't been here in forever because I missed Friday. So I haven't been with you since Wednesday and it, and it does, it matters to me. It gets to me when I feel like I don't touch base and I don't see all my buddies' names and that, you know, that we can't get together. It gets to me. So I wanted to do this tonight, but I know tomorrow I am going to be like, I have got to finish the advent calendars and ship them tomorrow. And that is probably going to kill me. So um, that's my plan for tomorrow. I'm shipping out everything Magdalena Christmas tree related and advent calendar related. I'm catching up on, I had quite a few big orders and we've been handing around sicknesses to each other in this house for the last three weeks. Um, now it's really my turn um to to go down like a like a lead weight but i'm gonna get everything out tomorrow i just don't think i can also be present for a show feeling how i feel but i will be with you on wednesday at our usual time um which is uh, noon eastern standard time and i will be with you on thanksgiving morning and kirsten tell me if this works how about if i log on at 10 o'clock for a one hour show on thanksgiving morning for those of you who are there um, I know a lot of people will not be there, but I also know a lot of people um, are home and maybe not, not doing stuff or visiting with family or maybe family isn't close by. And I really want to be there um, for people who aren't doing a lot and, and would like to just get together and have fun. We're going to have a fun Thanksgiving episode. So we'll do that on Thanksgiving morning. And then I want to remind you that next Friday, I will be live with my very good friend, Rebecca Martin of Storyteller Wool, and we will be having a two-person live show looking at her new book, which I just got in the mail today. So mm, so we have a nice week coming up, a week full of things uh, that'll be great to do. Good. I think 10 is good because it's, you know, it, 
all different time zones, right? All different time zones. But I know I have to be, I have to like eject the children from the house at about 1230 to make it to my sisters on time. So it gives us time and it gives me time to round them back up afterward. So that should be good. <coughs> it's a good thing that I have cold symptoms is all I can say because yesterday when we went out to eat after our shopping thing, I ate this chowder, which I, I mean, I love chowder, but I knew that it was bad. This happens all the time, right? I'm always telling you I ate food that was expired. I don't know what's wrong with me, but it was a restaurant. And I kept thinking, God, that tastes like death. Like it doesn't taste like anything I've ever, it must've been like a, it was like a very Scrooge-esque, but a rotten potato or something. And I thought, man, am I going to suffer for this later? So far, so good. I mean, the whole... I don't know why I ate the whole cup of chowder. There's just something so wrong with me. But um, it was kind of like, oh, I hardly ever come to this tavern. And when I do, I'm going to eat that chowder. And it was very clear that it was rancid. Like, it had to be a potato. Oh, God, I'm very lucky to be with you tonight. That's all I have to say. Between the update, between the cold, and between the potato, I'm very lucky to be here with you tonight. So let's do crossword time. How much did you get done? Did you get quite a bit done? Did anybody finish the whole crossword? And, you know, if you, I'm not even, if you do cheaty peaties and I shouldn't even call it cheaty peaties, that's absolutely fine. Who cares, right? This is for fun. We're not in Vegas, right? This is for fun. Some of these were very, very hard and some of them were very, very easy. But I thought different people coming into the show at different times have seen different shows and heard different things. Uh, and I just wondered if anybody got very, very far. I'm going to be gross. I'm so sorry. So let's start with a cross and let's fill this in together. And as we do, we will look at some images that correspond to the conversations that we're having as we fill it in. Oh, and you got all but two answers. Hoo, 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 you are very close. Good job. That's very good. And, and as we come up to them, tell me which ones they were. I'll be so curious to know which ones were the hard ones for you. So let's start with uh, we'll start across with number three, which is the first one that appears across. And the question was, felt lamb's tongues were originally used for dabbing ink and called, do you remember what the word is for what they were actually called first? Let me show you a picture. Hang on, let me come over here. Let me show you a picture of what they look like, a back in the day picture of what they look like. And that's the one. Oh, good, Anne, good. Um, oh, Maggie, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, pen wipers. That is the correct answer. Let me see it as it appears. Hold on. Let me get this sheet out. Maggie, we just started. We're on three across. That is it. Pen wipers. So one word, P-E-N-W-I-P-E-R-S. Pen wipers are a thing. When we see these early Victorian era lamb's tongue, we, we call them lamb's tongue uh, rugs or mats back in the day they were called pen wipers and what would happen was you would make these as gifts for example for for the man who worked in the office for the man who left the house to work and used a pen and sat at a desk and the pen with the ink with the old time pens right then the dipping it would often uh, poop all over the place just blot everywhere and so it was very typical to need typical to need to like wipe the nib of the pen and these were pen wipers. So a person sitting at their desk could just wipe the nib of the pen on one of the lamb's tongues. And when the when a specific lamb's tongue got too dirty, too inky, too wet and filthy, then it could be removed and either cl cleaned or replaced. So this was a real moment in time. And sometimes we call these rugs penny rugs, but they really are not technically penny rugs, right? Because there are no, the pennies were the round shapes, right? That people actually used like 1860s Civil War era pennies, which were much larger than today's pennies, trace around them to make penny rugs. There's no circles in this. This is a, um, oh, do you have a pen wiper? Gee, thanks, honey. I love my pen wiper. <laughs> I know, right? It sounds awful, but it actually was super practical, super practical. And you often see them in dark colors, right? And probably a thoughtful husband would be wiping um, on the darker color so that they could be cleaned or erased uh, or, or replaced or whatever. But it, it is a great moment in time and it is fun to find these in antique stores because yes, they're decorative, but they're way more functional than most people know. 
So the answer to that is uh, pen wipers. And these are two examples of pen wipers. So moving on to, we're gonna stick with across. We're gonna do all the across and then we're gonna do the downs. So five across. Fancy artisan frame created in 2005 by Stephen Schmidt Jr. Do you know what the name of this frame is? It is the coveted frame because I don't think that they're being made anymore. I might be wrong about that. They're certainly not being sold on the website anymore. Only parts are being sold on the website at this moment. There seem to be, God, I gotta pull myself together. There seemed to be a um, Etsy store that might be selling them. It was, I, I didn't, yes, and I didn't follow up a ton because it's been a really busy, busy time. I was trying to be present with my mom and not do work stuff. And then as soon as I got back, it was all about advent calendars. But I just did a perfunctory look and I saw that they weren't actual frames for sale on Snapdragon and you're good. And um, there was a reference to them on Etsy. I have to keep drinking. Um, it's the only thing that's going to keep me going here. I'm not drinking, drinking either. Let's look at what that Snapdragon looks like. I don't have the Snapdragon. I would really, I would really like one. My good buddy, Mohair Judy, she's my buddy, uh, Judy from um, Massachusetts. The reason I call her Mohair is because we went shopping and she literally emptied the store of its entire stock of Mohair, like really beautiful Mohair, uh, like emptied it, emptied, filled her Hummer with mohair. You don't say that very often. So I call her Mohair Judy, but she had one. And um, when I went to visit her one time, um, I used it and I thought, man, this is so cool. It snaps. Your rug snaps into place. You literally put it on the uh, frame and then you snap those wooden panels with your hand and it it pulls your rug outward four, four ways. Um, it's like a it's like a fancy lever, right? It's it's remarkable how well it works. It's also a beautiful looking thing. It's absolutely beautiful. When she put my piece on her Snapdragon, that's something else I've never said. Um, I, I've just never seen my my um, backing so taut. You know, it really was cool. I would really love to get a hold. Oh, if anybody's selling one of these, let me know. It really makes the fabric taut. Yeah, do you have one, Anne? I guess right. You have all the pretty stuff. Um, by the time I came to the craft and could afford to get a Snapdragon, they're not making Snapdragons. So um, that's just life, isn't it? But yeah, absolutely beautiful. So so congrats to you if you've got the first two correct already. Moving on to the third question. This is seven across. This is a form of ornamental needlework and also a style of quilting. So a form of ornamental needlework, so something you could stitch with a needle, but also the name, one of the two kinds of quilting, and it's not uh, piecing, right? It's not English piece, piecing, it's not patchwork. I heard somebody at the door, who's that? Um, and I bet you got the answer to that, it is applique. So let's see, let's look at a couple examples of applique. Uh, applique is just one of my favorite techniques no matter what you're doing with it it is a needle craft it is fabulous this is an i got i got a lot of images tonight off pinterest right and you know what pinterest is like for um accountability like they, they don't tell you anything so i don't know who the maker is on this but i thought it was exquisite small piece of applique it has a bit of a crazy quilt feel to it lots of interesting stitches on the side it's just one patch like what a beautiful piece to piece together a bunch of different patches. I can see that there is some almost uh, thick, like a feed sack or bark cloth weight fabric in the back. I can see there's what look like a little bit of um, material from maybe garments, clothing that's cut up. Um, some vintage fabrics is a uh, shiny kind of what looks like a 1970s um, night robe kind, nightgown kind of a thing in the middle on the bottom. And then there's the the plain. Um, circles right that maybe have a little bit of felt in there and a button and then some um, maybe machine stitching in some places in what looks like um, the sort of crow's feet or turkey's feet um, decorative crazy quilt stitching in other places that's probably done by hand so there's a mixture of hand work machine work uh, it's very visual it is it is the quilter's equivalent of a hit or miss you're just laying down um, pieces here that it looks like there's an abandoned log cabin up at the top too just absolutely beautiful idea applique literally means that you are applying something right you are applying something to your backing you're applying it applique 
And it's the same with quilting, right? This is a beautiful applique quilt. I think this is probably another Sue Spargo design where you have your backing fabric, right? We say foundation cloth. And you're just applying more shapes onto it to make pictures and make designs, either very, very three-dimensional, maybe with the help of trapunto, um, or very flat, doesn't matter. You are sewing on, whether it's with your hand and a needle or a machine, you're adding um, decorations to your backing cloth or your foundation cloth, and it is called applique. It is a great, it's a great technique to bring into rug hooking too. There's no reason why you can't do your rug part uh, hooked or punched or any any rug form and then add a little bit of applique, sewing it on because our backings as rug hookers are fabric, right? You can always sew fabric to fabric. That's never a thing. So that's always something to think about, always an option, particularly when, um, you know, you've got very fine little areas. Maybe you need something that is a little bit smaller scale and you want to do it in a different medium. You can use applique. We see that a lot these days in rug hooking. Look a bit like um, EB tree border. Oh, let me come back and see that. Yeah, it, do it does. Melissa, it does. It looks like the Magdalena um, lollipop tree a little bit in the border. It, ha it has like palm tree arms to it. Strange, but pretty. And I like the fountain in the middle. This is very contemporary. It looks like um, like a col obviously a collection of flowers, maybe that for different months of the year or whatever. Maybe someone chose, it could be like one of these block of the month things where you get a whole bunch of them and you piece them together kind of a thing. Um, but I think it's Sue Spargo just because it really looks like her. And um, oh, it's just an exquisite piece. That was a very, very good um, remark, Melissa, because it really does. It really does. I think because they're just like round shapes, right? So pretty. And Charlotte says, I, I like that. I love crazy quilting. I do too. I love crazy quilting. and I And I love... I love any kind of work that that makes it possible to freestyle, right? I obviously I love freestyling with you here. I'm not a big fan of scripts. I love working on projects where I can go, yeah, not so much, and just change it for something else or add something different. Um, I love I love all mediums that can kind of accommodate that kind of uh, variety and variation. And certainly rug making is one of them, but quilting is one of them too. And those two things can go together so well. We rarely see the two working in tandem, but I think we're going to see that more and more in the new year. Let's go to our next one. Let me come back to you here because that was our second. So let's go to our next question. Um, number nine across. This style of hook drug was once considered very basic and was reserved for non-company rooms, like kitchens and bedrooms, also bathrooms. What style of hook drug was plainer than others and was reserved for places where company wouldn't see, right? Uh, because you would, want to, you would want to save your best efforts for rooms where company uh, would, would see them, right? In front of the hearth or in front of the sofa or under a table. Uh, and the answer, scrappy, that's that's great. You know, I wish I would have thought of the word scrappy. I was I was not feeling well already when I put the thing together and my brain was not working. That's a good one. The answer is geometric. Geomet as much as we love geometrics now, um, geometrics have not always been revered. Uh, um, they were just considered easier, you know, technically uh, easier. Uh, let's look at some geometrics and see what we think. This first one. Sorry, it's a little bit out of focus. Um, this is maybe a proddy rug, but it doesn't matter. It's a it's a it's a handmade rug. It's a rag rug. Um, this one has that prominent red diamond uh, in it, which makes me think that it is from like Northern England or maybe Scotland. But the red diamond um, in the north of England was always like a superstitious thing to ward off evil. But this is an example of a geometric rug. Now this rug would have gone on the front stoop. Because the, anything with a red diamond, the idea was, uh, you know, keep evil out of the house, right? Um, don't 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 worry about evil once it's in the house. <laughs> try to keep it up. Try to be preventative about evil. It's funny because I'm sure I've told you this, but I always think about this beautiful house that we lived in in the um, when when I well I guess I was out of high school and I guess I had already started college in England, so I didn't spend a lot of time there. It was mostly like at Christmas. And in the summer I was home, I was at theater school then, and I loved this house. It was built 
Um, it was built in the early 1860s and it had three fireplaces, but only one worked. And when my dad went down to the dirt floor in the basement to try to fix something, if he had the light on in the basement, you could see right, there was like no grout between the floorboards anymore. It was probably like mud. You could see right through it. You could see him, you could see him down there just like struggling with, you know, the panel with the fuses and whatever. It, it was incredible. The, it was like, how did this house make it for so long? Um, there were so many um, sketchy things about it. And in the kitchen, there was like a lazy Susan in the shelving. And uh, my mom often woke up first and, and opened the Lazy Susan. And there was a squirrel there like this with the sweet and low box and putting his nuts in the sweet and low box. Like, excuse me. I mean, it, this house was very easily p penetrated by like forest folk and all kinds. But one of the interesting features it had was a witch's bench or a witch's seat. And it was inside the chimney. And it was in the main room, like the main living, the main living room. God, was that the ultimate Christmas house? Oh, I wish we could all be there together. It was just so crooked and slanted, and the the record player was always set up playing beautiful old Christmas records. And the my dad had the Christmas tree in the corner, and where the two windows were on the sides, and he actually had to keep the windows open a hair and rope around the Christmas tree, put the rope outside, right, coming back into the trunk of the tree, because otherwise the tree would fall because the the floor was so crooked. But that fireplace had a um, witch's seat. And the idea was that if an evil witch wanted to come into your house, maybe the witch would be satisfied and um, so pleased that there was a seat inside the chimney because she would enter through the chimney. There, there's a lot of assumptions being made here. And she would be so pleased to just be able to take a seat that she would kind of forget about entering the house and creating mayhem and spreading evil, right? That she would just exit again after that. But um, all these funny superstitions, right? Such, such fun. We're counting them and thinking about them and hearing about other ones from other places. So this is quite British. Uh, great example of a geometric. Here's a geometric with a figural, um, with some bling to it, right? So it's a very, very sort of geometric hit or miss, p very PC, puzzly. Uh, but there has been an attempt in some of the blocks to put, and I think this is very clever, um, because it, it, it tells a story. It's mostly shapes. It's very Paul Clay, right? Picture Paul Clay's work. It's very Paul Clay. But in the center, we have obviously the person's house and then a little flower garden off to the side. Beloved pet down below, maybe a black lab or a standard poodle or something. And then off to the side, I guess that's maybe they were lucky enough to live on the water. It looks like they do. With a house like that, with, with two um, sort of portico porches like that, it would make a lot of sense that you'd be on the water and want to spend a lot of time out there and then the little sun up on top. So this is a variation. Oh, I do too, Melissa. So good, isn't it? And then the kind of spokes in the corners. Uh, you can just see the person's, like, no pun intended, the wheels turning in their head, thinking, you know, oh, okay, let me do, I'll outline everything in black. Okay, that's all set. And then just blast it with the colors that they had. And then in the corners, you know, you, when you think about it, there is a lot of design sense to saying, uh, okay, let me alternate two maroons for two greens because not everybody does even have that much design sense, right? We do crafts and art, so we kind of have it hardwired to do that. But, you know, when you look at very early rugs, not everybody does. That You know, another person might be like, okay, let's put a red one here and then a red one right next to it. And, oh, no, I'm out of red. All right, well, that's a problem. But, you know, just all of these instinctive design choices that we see in, in hit or miss rugs of this style, I think this is a mid 20th century, I, I would think that this is like a 1960s rug, that kind of era, 50s, 60s. But I think it's absolutely beautiful. And I love the shapes. It really feels like Paul Clay to me. Um, but I just love how they they weren't they weren't kind of channeling a crazy quilt because it's not a lot of straight lines. It's a lot of wacky lines. It was more like they were channeling a jigsaw puzzle than a crazy quilt. We don't get these strong angles. We get lots of soft lines. Uh, there's weird places where a lot of lines resolve at the same sort of crossroads or juncture, um, like above the house, and that's a bit unexpected. Uh, but because there's not a lot of that, it doesn't look messy, and it does have a bit of a stained glass look to it, too. I, this is an exceptional rug. I've never seen this rug until I, I was in a scramble tonight. I literally put the show together right before because I really wasn't sure with the way I was feeling if I was going to make it or not. But I, I just, just found this half an hour ago, and I thought, man, that is, that's a good rug, isn't it? 
really pretty. I found a lot of pretty images tonight. It was almost like, you know, um, the universe was, was on my side going, I know you don't have a lot of time and you don't have a lot of presence of mind right now. I'm going to throw some really good images at you that you've never seen before. And so it's great to be able to share them because some of these are like just brand new, great inspiration pieces. So let's move on to, um, we're still at across. So let's go across to number 10, 10 across. This is a type of a hook with a severe angle. Right, so this hook looks different than other hooks. And I had to put some small words in here um, just to make the crossword happen. If you have all big words, it, it just eliminates a lot of the words because they it can't accommodate you know a lot of big phrases. So this is a small word and the solution is bent. This is a bent hook. There's only so many kinds of hooks out there, right? But this is a bent hook. So if you're a beginner, this hook is actually turning downward. And when you're holding it up over your piece, your your hand, a, a lot of people really like this for like anti-carpal tunnel, anti-arthritis. It works really well for those kinds of conditions. Um, you're holding it over and you're not having to perform this motion right like like i'm always digging down and picking back up pulling back up because the thing is already pointed down so you're literally going like this with it instead of like this right where you could see just by the motion of and i'm not exaggerating it that's it's, sometimes it's even like oh but it's literally just like this because it's already bent so it's a preference thing it's worth giving it a try for me, the bent hook, I'm still very happy with the straight hook for myself for now, but I do have a bunch of bent hooks, uh, like the Hartman hook, a Hartman bent hook, which is the one I'm showing in this picture. Um, I do have a bunch of them, and so far I haven't loved them only because I'm not used to going like this. So you know what it is? It's the same reason that, I, uh, that I'm always struggling with my glasses and I don't wear the ones that the doctor prescribed. It's because they're bifocals and you're supposed to give it a chance and give them time and I can't, I just can't. I just, ha I haven't thus far. And it's the same thing with the hook. I think you just have to give it a chance and see how it feels in your hand. It's one of those things that if you don't start on it, it feels very alien and it's confusing for me to use. My brain um, doesn't like it. Right. My brain, my hand's okay holding it, but my brain doesn't like it. So, um, yeah, but it, everybody feels differently. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And I'm sure that sooner or later, I will be holding a bent hook quite often. I just have to give it a little bit of time. Lisa, good to see you. Oh, that's okay. It's a weird night. I'm not surprised you forgot. It is a weird night. Once in a while, once in a while, it has to be a Sunday. So the answer to that was bent hook. I only had the one image for that. So let's move on to number 11 across. This old rare form of rug making is part crochet and part shearing. So before I give you the answer, maybe you know the answer and feel free to shout it out. Hold on one second. Um, shearing. So shearing is like when you have a piece of fabric and you gather it up, right? That And there, are, there is such a thing as a sheared rug, which is also called a caterpillar rug, where you have just a strip of material and you gather it all up and then you literally sew it down like where the thread is, right? Right in the middle, not like where it's all ruffled and pretty, but where the, and then you get great height, right? And great soft sort of uh, surface to it. Uh, and this works the same way. This craft is most commonly called charray. Yes, good one, Anne. You had to look that up. The thing about charay, and I'm about to do a segment on it, like in the new year, right? Because I ran into the woman at the Fiber Festival whose whose mother really made charay popular in the 20th century, like really. Uh, and she made an adaption because it already existed. I'm trying to think of what it was called. Oh, my brain is not working well tonight. It had a different name. It was exactly the same craft, but it had a different name. And um, the, this family, the Sheree family, right, that I will interview, you know, as soon as the holidays are over, because they're also in Connecticut. Um, super, super smart idea that the mom had of adapting what is this long, very thin wire hook. So it looks like a crochet hook on one side, and it's like almost sharp on the other side, so you can put your material on it. 
she came up with this great idea of putting a very pronounced bend in it. And the reason is the way that you hold the hook. Let me just grab this pencil. The way that you hold the hook is like this. So when it was just round, it would just keep turning on you, right? Because you're trying to string the thing and it just keeps turning because it's this tiny wire, right? Very thin wire. So she put almost like, you know, the pause Easter things and you know that little metal thing and it um it, it has a little handle on it and it's like zigzag along the edge and it's great with the zigzags of, along the handle because you can put your thumb on it and it stops the thing from flipping over right because it's just an empty hole that's holding an egg that quite would, would quite like to break right so if it was just like the slippery handle it would turn and your egg would fall but because it has zigzags along the handle you can kind of press down on it or hold it in such a way that you leverage it and it's not going to flip. Well, this is the exact same principle. It has a bend in it. So you put your finger on the bend and there's no way the needle is going to turn either way. It's such a small adaptation, but it's so necessary. It's absolutely crazy to think about doing this craft without that tiny modification to the hook, to the handle, to the tool. Let me show you what it looks like if you haven't seen it um, lately or ever. Yeah, Judy, it is, you have to go look it up. It's super interesting. It's absolutely beautiful. It uses a remarkable amount of material, but it doesn't have to be wool. So these are some charret rugs, and the word charret literally means sheared and crochet, because it's like a crochet hook, but you're shearing onto it. And you're making typically thick pieces. Thin pieces don't work as well for charret. You're doing thicker pieces. Um, and last time we talked about it, the question came up, are they big trippers on the floor? I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. But once you know they're there, you're good, right? Because so are welcome mats, right? Those are really tall and big. And, you know, is it possible to trip on them? Absolutely it's possible. But, um, you know, your brain gets used to knowing that they're there. They also make great, I mean, they're super plush, um, they make great chair pads too, right? If you want to sit somewhere for a long time, like in a desk situation, this is, they're nice and thick and plush and just the makeup of them, you see, it is like ribbon candy, right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is a, a charade rug that is not round. This is rows of charade that you can put together like this. They're piecing it together like, like a log cabin quilt with a border on it. Right. This is also just as easily done. You're just doing charade, right? You're, you're doing a piece of ribbon candy on your hook and then you're attaching it. But you do use the crochet. You, you do put the loops on with a crochet stitch. I know that sounds impossible. I love it when you say, <laughs> I've even say that in our family for so long, Jack Tripper, for anything that you can trip. God, I, I just loved him. He was such a genius, wasn't he? Um. <laughs> Yeah, and I have a couple, I just couldn't, I, I really, I will go down the rabbit hole with Sheree because I have all of the tools, I have extra tools, I have all of the special twine, this is the Sheree hook. So you see what I mean, how there's that bend, and you can put your finger on that part of it so that it doesn't flip over and mess up what you're trying to do, because it is quite thin, and you see the little crochet head to it. So you're basically pulling and knotting in between as you go. You're doing stitches in between each fold. You can see that just like with rug hooking, at least primitive rug hooking, you can see that they are not perfectly measured. Well, isn't that the beauty of it? I mean, really, isn't that the beauty of it? If it was perfect, would you, would your heart like race when you saw this kind? My heart races when I see this. You can also see that kind of orangey purple material on the left, right? That's going vertical. It's all scrappy and it's a bit crappy too. It's like, it's all thready. It's not performing well, but it looks great and they're able to use it. Keep a hold of all of your wool and, you know, um, uh, blends that are not working well for rug hooking. Keep a hold of all of them until the new year when I have time to go visit the family. Uh, her name is Lady who does, hold on one second, I'm gonna blow my nose, so I'm gonna go on mute just for a second. Okay, um, her name is Lady and we're gonna visit with her. Um, she's not gonna teach us because she has a teaching video, so I'm not gonna kind of um, overstep with with trying to get her to teach on my video. She has a teaching video that is for sale. But what I will do 
is I want to visit with her and I want to talk about her family history because this is a gem. Having a mother in the family who teaches both of her daughters how to do charade, does it in a very different style, adapts a tool, uh, and then the craft becomes quite popular again. It's really an interesting story. It's an interesting family story. So I'll be visiting her and talking about her story. I'm going to be uh, plugging her like crazy and showing you, you know, she's got a book, she's got the tools, she's got the twine, she's got the video. Um, but I can guarantee you, I'll also be making some charade rugs. So I'm going to share the way that I make them with you. She's the expert. I'll just be fooling around, but I'm going to try to make rugs um, in this style in the new year because I honestly just, oops, oh, uh oh. Okay, that was a bit of a spoiler alert. Sorry about that. Um, I just can't get enough charade in my life. It's it's so beautiful. It's so different. I have a lot of charade mats. But what I saw at the Fiber Festival when I went, and Lady was there with the sister. I forgot the sister's name. And the mother's uh, passed away years ago. But she had, I think I mentioned, some of her mother's work, which was much more subdued palette-wise. And it was very, very tight. So it was technically really good, really tight. Um, I don't know if good is the same, right, as being technically perfect. But ladies, is are, her rugs that she makes currently are much, much looser and much livelier colors, right? So it's just very, very different from one generation to the next. Um, lady kind of lays off that tight, sort of rigid, very technical feel to the rugs and just kind of does it her way in different color palette every time, but bright. So very different than her mom. Same craft, same family. It's a beautiful story. All right, let's keep going. Um, okay, so that was um, that was Shere. Uh, okay, let's go to number fifteen across. This technique involves rolling wool strips into little rondelles. Sometimes I say cinnamon buns, right? And I just gave you a spoiler here. Sorry about that, but um, I think you know what these are. We talk about we talk about these a lot. These are quillies. And some people, when they put a grouping of quillies together and you have a rug that is just made up of quillies, um, it can be called a standing wool rug. Standing wool means the wool is standing on its side. It doesn't have to be a circle. It can be any shape. It can be just back and forthies like this, right? Just like this. Right? but long pieces, right? And then they can be shaped around other pieces and sewn tacked the same way that the quilly are tacked. Um, this is a great craft. This is a very versatile craft. I do have a quilly video coming right, literally coming right up. Um, and then as soon as I get the advent calendars and the Magdalena's out, the quilly video is coming out immediately. Um, because I, I wanted to do that with the fall stuff because those of you who had the fall advent calendar got a bunch of strips and you can certainly hook with the strips, of course, right? But you could also do Quilly. And I was thinking we'd do Quilly together, and I haven't gotten it to it yet. So, and with the Mag with so many Magdalena trees, I've got four different Magdalena, like evergreen patterns, like Magdalena trees in the shape of Christmas trees. It's a great idea, instead of hooking the berry centers, to do um, Quilly, right? I mean, how perfect is that? So we are going to be talking about Quilly soon. This is a close-up image of a Quilly rug I have, standing wool, because it's not, you see how some of it's just back and forth, back and forth, and some of it is the circle that's been squished into squares. It almost looks like that English um, um, licorice, you know what I mean? And I had the, this, this isn't my photograph, but I bought this rug. So I have this in my first book in, I hope it wasn't cut, you know, now that I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, is it in there? in the Quilly chapter, uh, because I thought, I love this rug, and I thought, this is a great example of standing wool slash Quilly. Judy says, so charade is kind of like a standing wool technique as well, right? Yeah, it absolutely is. Judy, it absolutely is. It's just a different tool. So when you do Quilly, you're literally just rolling up your strips, and then you're just sewing through it to tack it in place, and then you just decide, like, where its place is in the whole composition. And if you're doing kind of hit or miss, and I promise I will do a good video on this as soon as I catch up and feel a little bit better. As soon as you make something, right, the question becomes, um, where, where does this go in the composition? Like, am I going to hit or miss it? Am I just going to do a whole bunch of, sh like, like I'm doing candy making or something? Am I just going to sit down, do a whole bunch of shapes and do quilly and, you know, different stitch them to hold them in place? And then I put down all of these little things that are little finished things that look like little pastries and then I can just sit 
and think um, almost like a like a board game. How do they fit together? How can I fit them together? Right. I've seen a lot of people, including Ellen Gould of Three, Three Sisters Farm. I really like Ellen. I use a lot of her work in my books. Um, she she often gets little trays, you know, wooden trays from like home goods or whatever. And she does just a bunch of quilly and then she fits them in. Right. And then and then decides how they are going to fit together. But she'll fill like the bottom of a tray or some kind of a like old antique like basket or old draw an old antique draw that kind of thing man that's pretty what if you got you know how you see antique draws all over the place like the little um draws from like the sewing machines and you know with the pretty decorated decorated fronts carved with little brass findings and stuff what if you what if you got a whole series of those filled them with quilly and then put them up on the wall sideways where you could stand like little trinkets and um, tchotchkes up, but have behind, right, on the back, like on the floor of the shelf, on the shelf. But since the shelf is up on the wall, all of the quillies behind and then your little tchotchkes in front, wouldn't that be adorable? You could do that with any, any kind of a thing, but a nice old thing, you know, that has that good old time country charm would work really well, right? Super fun. Super fun. So let me see. I think I might have done one more. I think I have one more Quilly image. Let me just double check so we don't do cheaty peaties. No, I don't. So I'm going to move on to the next question instead of doing cheaty peaties. So 16 across. The acronym for ATHA is the Association of Blank Rug Cooking Artists. So it's going to start with a T, isn't it? And I say this a lot. Probably don't say it enough because it's a great organization. But the answer is traditional. The Association of Traditional Rug Hooking Artists. So let me show you the cover of Atha Magazine. If you don't subscribe to Atha, you absolutely should. Being a member of Atha, being part of a chapter, and being able to meet and have access to lots of great speakers over the course of a year, uh, lots of fun things going on, that whole social aspect of being in a group and being able to learn in person, that is also Atha, but that's completely separate uh, from a subscription to the magazine. And the Atha Biennial is coming up in Texas this year. So that's something to think about as well. So the, the answer is traditional, the Association of Traditional Rug Hooking Artists. So traditional. actually, it's traditional hooking artists, isn't it? I'm just reading that. I always say traditional rug hooking. It's traditional hooking artists. No rugs in there. Gosh, I never, I would have bet my life that it was rug hooking artists. It's not funny. All right, I'm not going to do a spoiler on the next one. It'll be too easy if I do a spoiler. So number number 19 across, this famous Garrett Blue Nose uh, pattern, it's a fairy tale rug. So what fairy tale can you think of that's super, super famous that an old company like Garrett Blue Nose would have done? I know that you know because it's their second best selling pattern of all time after the actual blue nose schooner the boat and I'm sure that you know so let me bring you back over here it is for sure the three bears and this is such a beloved pattern um, I know this is when our buddy crystal is coveting when I see them I always look to see if they're stupidly priced or if I can grab one for her and send it to Canada um, we haven't seen her for a while I think she's working on a book project so uh, um, we'll find out more about that, I guess, a little bit later. But man, she and so many other people really look for the specific pattern because it's such a thing. And again, many of these are on Pinterest and on auction sites, so I don't know the makers. When I do know the makers, I will tell you. But obviously between this one and this one, they're reversed. So presumably, I can tell that this one is hooked, right? Because you can see the directional hooking. It's very wide. I think this one is punched. Um, and it's reversed, so that makes a lot of sense. Of course, the photo could be reversed, but this is yarn, and I'm guessing because it's reversed that it is just punched. But there are infinite uh, versions of the three little, uh, sorry, the three bears, and um, they're each, you know, it, I can see having a whole collection of these. It would be such a slippery slope because once you started, you wouldn't want to pass any of them up, would you? Um, it's just so, from in my mind at least, it's so fun to, the, these are some weird looking bears, I have to say. 
there is something wrong with these bears. I'm not sure that these that these are bears, if you see what I mean. I think they I think we have some alien intruders here in the in the shape of bears. But you know, it's so it's so cool to think of so many different people over the years sitting in front of the same pattern and hooking it differently. I think there's something so beautiful about it's just the ultimate example of each person being able to put their own spin on something in this craft and to be able to say, oh, okay, three bears, three different sizes, um, you know, male, female, baby, um, what colors do I want to make the clothes, the bowl, the background, all that stuff. Did you notice one of them? I didn't even point it out, but one of them was actually grounded. Like it, they weren't floating in the air um, like this. Is it? Yeah, it's this one. So there is one, two, three layers of like earth or ground, that pretty shapey blue, and then a uh, kind of pistachio, and then like a more brownie green in the background. So there's three different ledges of, of color um, that's grounding the three bears. This is a very, very different one, but you can see you can use different sweaters. And it's just, it's a lot of fun to think about, isn't it? It's a lot of fun to think about how you would approach that same pattern and this being such an old pattern and and it, at least in new england it's very easy to find examples of this they are usually in terrible shape and overpriced um, it's a bad combo but yeah it's very romantic to think about who the makers were for sure number 20 across this is a rug making hook with a crochet end on one side um, and kind of a needle eye on the other side like an oversized needle to thread something through and this isn't charade because we already talked about charade. This is a different craft. So what do you think that this one might be? I'm going to show you an image to help you out. Locker hook. Good job, Judy. This is locker hooking. So let me show you an example of it. Oops, sorry. That's not it. That's the alien. See, I told you they're after us. Locker hooking. So um, this is a craft that is done on what we normally think of as latch hook backing and she's got her hand covering it, but you can see the crochet and on the locker hook, the part that her hand is covering is like a giant needle's eye, right? The eye to put the fabric through. So you're putting through, um, the, whatever material you've got and it's usually ripped strips of cotton. Uh, cotton is the most common fiber to use when doing locker hooking, um, just traditionally. And this is another craft that uses a lot of material. But what you're doing with your locker hook is you're tunneling. And you, as you tunnel, the eye of the needle is dragging through kind of a rope, um, a cord, right, a piece of twine under your finished loops so that if the loops were going to pull out, they would not be able to pull out because they are actually locked into place by a piece of twine that is going through all of the loops. For that reason, because there is twine that's tunneling from loop to loop to loop, you don't have as much freedom of design as you do uh, with other forms like rug hooking, where we're still using loops, but we know as rug hookers, the loops don't come out. This ends up looking much more geometric, and this is on a much larger scale. So this finished product has a little bit more of a rag rug look. It's a very, very pretty look. Uh, this is from a, a page in a site called Go Color Crazy. And I've used a lot of Go, Go Color Crazy's images in my first book because I did a chapter on locker hooking. Um, it's, it's great to be able to draw your designs onto. This is latch hook backing. You can tell because it's gridded in blue, right? Which many latch, contemporary latch hook is. But you can see, she, I mean, she is absolutely an expert on it. She's very good at doing directional stuff with the locker hooking. She also sells, do you see that yellow spool that looks like painter's tape? It's pre-cut, like exactly perfectly pre-cut cotton that's spun on. So you're literally just attaching your locker hook, threading the eye of the needle on the other end with whatever color you choose, because it's all pre-cut. And you're just, you know, uh, pulling up, making loops and tunneling through with the crochet end. And the loop is kind of following you or trailing you under the loops and locking them into place on the surface. And you can draw directly onto your backing to come up with ideas like this. And it's super, super fun uh, working like this. But you do have to be thoughtful about not doing something that's overcomplicated because this craft really can't handle detail. It's much more graphic. And because of the, the nature of the big fat loops, um, you can't get tons of detail in there. 
and it's really not what this craft is about. This is a great rag craft, and you can use your pieces as rugs, um, but there is the additional kind of aspect to a, it that you are tunneling with your hook, and that the twine has to be, you know, through the needle's eye so that um, your, your loops are standing up well, nicely and well, um, and they're locked into place. You know, whether they need to be or not, well, that's a different conversation. But this is the way the craft work. This is the way this is the, the way the tool looks. Um, and it is a lot of fun. It can be tricky. So Judy says, I've been playing with it a little. I like it a lot, but that backing is nasty. Yeah, the you know, it's very rough. Um, it's very heavy and rough. It's very stiff. It's real scratchy. Uh, latch hook backing. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I don't. I, I, you know, I tend to wear like fingerless gloves when I lean on latchet backing and it's when I want to sit up at the table and I just want to work that way and, and I've got a lot of really thick pieces that I want to work into a piece. I, I tend to still rug hook uh, into latchet backing. I really love rug hooking into latch hook, but um, it is stiff and, you know, this time of year, if you can wear little cotton gloves, remember the gloves people used to get to put moisturizer on at night and then put cotton gloves over their hands? Those kinds of really thin gloves are really handy with this craft. So something to think about. It's just something different. I'm going to mute you again. I'm going to blow really quick. Hang on. All right. I love, I love that little trick. All right. Let's move to our next question. And yeah yeah it's the only way isn't it you gotta say you gotta save your hands because you do it's right here isn't it that you take such a bad beating it's it's awful it really hurts um okay so next one is 21 across amy oxford was first trained by this bennington rug making company it's a punching with yarn company i'll give you that um clue as well and amy oxford now um she bought at um at auction like you know it, like it was like a garage situation but she bought at auction um a ton of these patterns i think all of these patterns and bit by bit she's bringing them to light and recreating them and putting them up for sale again under her brand which is called amy oxford so what is the name of the company that she worked for it was she was babysitting for the family back in the day and uh and then she kind of started working in the in the business in the store part of it uh and it is called mcadoo so hold on just a second. Let me show you some images of McAdoo rugs. They are rugs that are punched with yarn. This is a really large McAdoo rug, but you can see the fine hit or miss background. This is on their website. Just beautiful image. Um, really, really well done border. Very classy. Uh, McAdoo rugs pull from a lot, uh, they, inspiration from lots of different places. They pull from a lot of sort of um, world, like there's a travel element to many of them, but then there's a cozy element to many of, of them. So we see a lot of exotic trees, exotic animals in the McAdoo rugs, but we also see like pugs and, and uh, retrievers. So it's a great variety of subjects. There's a lot of nautical subjects as well. This is sort of, this is an otter, I guess, or a beaver, maybe an otter um, in the water. It's, it's a very... Uh, varied and large catalog of work so a holiday holiday scene so it is nice to know and I know she's moving as fast as she can like as fast as one human being can move um, running her business and and um, and going through this incredible um, collection of of patterns on paper that need to be kind of stabilized and transferred and it may be or not adopted I don't know but just going through them would be a mammoth effort, wouldn't it? So the answer to that was McAdoo, which is M-C-A-D-O-O. -O. So, um, oh, God, I have such a sore throat. It's just ridiculous. I know I got to do honey. I have not done honey yet. And you know what's ironic? That guy at that fair, you know, there were so many food stalls. And the guy at the honey booth was particularly aggressive. And I never respond well when someone is like shouting out to me about chutney or honey or something. Like I love chutney and honey, but if you're going to just shout out to me when I'm in the middle of a conversation, it's not going to go well. So I kind of ignored him. Um, but now I wish I didn't because, man, he had a table full of the most exquisite looking honey. And I mean, it was crazy flavors. He had like ghost pepper honey. Why didn't I buy it? I could use that right now. See, that's what I get for being a jerk and being unkind, just breezing by him. Um, 
Yeah, I could use that honey right now, that's for sure. Next question. Okay, so 23, this is a typo. This is, the, as far as I saw, the only typo on here. I'm super sorry about this. 23 reads like this, point needle art. It should not have the word point, and that's kind of a hint. Um, this is a needle art, not point, well, point of a needle, but I'm sorry about that typo. Needle, this is a needle art that features miniature stitches. So you're doing something with your needle and you're making stitches, but they're so tiny. Do you know what this form of needle point or needle work is called? I bet you do. I'm taking my socks off because now it feels like it's 200 degrees in here. Oh, good Lord. Sorry. Whoo, hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, it is called Petty Point. Let's look at Petty Point. I used to love Petty Point. I still have a few pieces hanging around the house that are done in Petty Point. It is so tiny uh, and exquisite. Absolutely teeny, teeny, tiny. Uh, petty, it's like petite, small. So in this piece, there's three scale of stitch. If you look at the background, that's like normal needlepoint, right? And if you look at the costumes, that's that's quite small. So some people would call that petty point. I don't know what the definition of petty point is as far as how many stitches per inch or if there is such a measurement. Um, but if you look at the faces, you can see whoa okay so there we're talking about very very different weights of yarn and needles uh yeah ex good job melanie um very 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 small scale of work really lovely so you know this is really dated these bags are dated i see these a lot in antique stores and stuff and i typically pass them by but sometimes i this is i, I don't have this one this is a photo from um, pinterest but sometimes i see them ones like this and i think Wow, it's like a tapestry, but it's a little clutch handbag. This is maybe something I want to start collecting. Wouldn't this make a beautiful collection? It's just so lush and colorful. The amount of the peachy roses, the amount of the pinky roses, all of the different shades. It's just like a rug that we would love, right? But it's a purse. It's a clutch. Uh, and you do see lots of these, and they are so often done in petty point uh, and beautifully done and they don't typically sell for a lot because there's not a huge uh, fashion for them at this moment we also see petty point a lot with uh, miniature dollhouse rugs so that makes sense doesn't it because you end up looking with like you've got a pretty kill em type rug or a really fancy oriental rug um, but the only reason it looks so fancy is because there's so much detail and the only reason there's so much detail is because it's done in petty point so yeah, absolutely beautiful. I'll tell you, I think I missed the boat on Petty Point because when I did have the eyesight to do it, I wasn't that interested. I did a lot of needle point, but I didn't do Petty Point. And now, I mean, forget it. It's, yeah, I would need like the Hubble telescope to be able to see the stitches for Petty Point. It's ridiculous. But I do have in the basement, and I've told you about these before, they're often on eBay and Etsy, the pre made canvases. Um, for like cushions, right? Where I, I think they're just called pre-made or um, not started. There's a better word. You'll you'll find them. You'll know what I mean. But look for like um, I guess pre-made, isn't it? I'll figure it out. But it's like it's a needlepoint, like from the 50s or 60s, and um, the hard parts have been done in petty point. So if you've got, for example, like the courting couple, like the, you know, 18th century courting couple or like some kind of a Gainsborough type of a scene where you've got lots of great skin tone, it's real specific and expressive, that's all done for you in Petty Point. And I don't know if these canvases were done like by a machine or by people in other countries, but the idea was that the hard part was done, you get, you get the needlepoint backing and you have to fill all the rest of it in. So the hard part's done with whatever the picture was, and sometimes it's animals and stuff too, sometimes it's a cottage. And then you, according to the colors in your room, you stitch the background color in whatever, maroon, navy, or whatever fits your room. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, they're, they, I'm gonna think about it. And if you can think of what the word might be, you tell me, because again, my brain's not firing well tonight. But um, yeah, those are a lot of fun to get a hold of. And you get a lot of petty point options. Uh, with those guys, those little canvases. All right, let's keep going. Um, oh, here's, this is maybe an easy one. It's a straightforward one, at least. Pearl McGowan was from which state? Do you know that off the top of your head? 
Jossie, is that you? Gosh, she's in there coughing like crazy. Poor little thing. She must have her headphones on because she doesn't hear me. The answer is, oh, it's my favorite state. It's not the state where I live. This, this is uh, Massachusetts. I put this picture of Boston, right? The old state house in Boston. So pretty, right? Uh, Fennel Hall is right to the right here. And uh, this is on the Freedom Trail, right? Such a beautiful, beautiful city. Such a beautiful state. Massachusetts. So many parts um, of Massachusetts are just absolutely gorgeous. And of course, Pearl McGowan, um, I think she was, I think she had um, um, something on Boylston Street in Massachusetts. I, at least I think so from the canvases. Um, if I knew, I'm ashamed to say that I forgot, but, um, she also worked closely with, was it Sturbridge Village, Sturbridge Village, it, also in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, back in the seventies, she sold a lot of kits at, in the gift store at Sturbridge Village. If you've been to Sturbridge, it's a big gift store. And, you know, like for, even for someone like me who loves, who's a great consumer and loves to get stuff. It's, it's not a great gift store anymore. I'm sorry. It's just, you know, do I want a mug? I mean, do I really want, you know, it, there's not like, there's a few interesting history books, but it's not a really big library. It used to be a much bigger library of books for sale, like much bigger. It's not like that anymore. There's a few food products, but they're food products that I also see it's like stop and shop. It's not super exciting, but I, I really, I'm, I'm so um, kind of nostalgic for this day that you know, I probably was at Sturbridge in the 70s when kits were a big part of that gift store, rug cooking kits, but I was little, right? And I, I, I didn't clock them, if that's the case. I, I was busy crocheting with my grandmother and I didn't think about other stuff. And um, I bet you anything, I walked by a great display of her kits. What a thought that is. I never thought of that before. Um, interesting. But the way I picture that, the way the store used to look with like all crafts, even 20 years ago, I remember it 20 years ago and there would be like, Oh, you want to make a lantern out of like, you know, by punching tin or whatever. There was all kinds of kits for stuff like that. And now it's kind of like, do you want chutney? You want your gutters? You want, want your gutters cleaned? Not, not exactly, but you know what I mean? It's just, yeah, it's not as exciting as it used to be, but I guess, uh, without the rug hooking aspect of it, that's, uh, yeah, it, or any kits, right? Or any kids. There's lots of coloring books and stuff like that. Whatever. All right. So, Jocelyn, jo come here for a sec. This next question is is kind of about her, so she's gonna like this. Can you bring the pillow, the pillowcase, your favorite pillowcase? Um, do you have pants? Oh yeah. Do you have pants on? Okay. <laughs> here she comes. So the next question is. Don't answer the question, Joss. The next question is. Uh, 29 across, what kind of animal is jam sandwich? Jam sandwich. Are you bringing it? I don't know where it is. Oh, no, jam sandwich is gone. Well, jam sandwich is on my shirt, right? This is Jossie's drawing, and my shirt is super dirty. Sorry about that. It's a cat. It's a cat. Sorry. This, it, I, I can promise you... I have about a hundred extra pounds on me right now, but I'm never as big as I look on this camera. What? What was the question? What animal is jam sandwich? Come on, it's right, isn't it right there in that room? Find that pillow. Here, Joss, sit here for one second. I'll find it. Can you talk about your inspiration for jam sandwich? Be, appro be appropriate? Okay, go Hello. ahead. Let me find the pillow. Hello. It was a pillow, though. That's all you got to say about it? Yep, a pillowcase. Right. Where did it go? Oh, go check Teddy's room. Go check Teddy's room. Okay. Sorry. One more try. I just want to show you what the inspiration for jam sandwich was. Um, it's a, it is indeed a pillowcase. I, you gleaned that from that eloquent speech you just gave, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, she, she, she wanted to draw something one night and this pillowcase is quite pretty and she drew jam sandwich from it. Did you find it? No. Uh, I'll show you one of these days. It doesn't look anything like jam sandwich, but it really is pretty. And, um, this is jam sandwich Thanksgiving edition. 
but I was wearing the Halloween shirt and there's also a jam sandwich. Let me show you. There's also a jam sandwich. Can I use the bathroom? Okay, use the bathroom. Thanks for letting me know. Um, oh, I gotta get a better photo, but this is the yarn. This is a very small piece. I hooked up jam sandwich. This is plain old jam sandwich, the original, the OG. And then, oh, uh oh. Okay, I didn't even get the next one in. Sorry about that. There's like, there's a bunch of different Halloween ones she did with different hats and costumes on and stuff, but Jim Sandwich is a cat. The answer is cat. And it is kind of like, it is the best-selling design at Ribbon Candy Hooking, and she reminds me about that all the time. But, um, yeah, the answer is cat, C-A-T. <laughs> She's in the bathroom now, so hopefully we don't hear anything from that quarter. It's way down the hall, but she can be impressive when, when she wants to. Okay, let's see, number 30. Uh, across this style of hooking is done with a very wide cut strip so this kind of hooking is done with an either 8 or 9 10 8 or above size strip and this type of hooking is hang on primitive um, again a Pinterest image but we can see it's quite wide cut a lot of primitive hooking is done by cutting and ripping. The wool, most wool can uh, sustain being cut and ripped because the strips are so wide. When you go thinner, you really can't. But for primitive stuff, um, yeah, it, it, can it can take it. So primitive is, again, number eight and above. Um, just really wide strips. strips. You're hooking with really wide strips and it's always a good recommendation to hook on a loose backing with wide strips because otherwise it's really tough to pull each loop up through a really tight backing like rug warp, even monk's cloth. I, I like doing all my primitive hooking in burlap or linen, but it's got to be loosey-goosey or it's going to be uh, lots of pain. One of the great sort of rug hooking, as Rita would say, goats, greatest of all times, uh, greatest of all time hookers is Edith O'Neill of Texas. And this is one of Edith's designs. Um, her book I covered ages ago, um, uh, uh, The Red House, The Red Cape. Red Cape, I know it burnt down. That makes me so sad every time I think about it. But Edith O'Neill, um, for me, is, for me personally, is the most important, just primitive hooker within rug hooking. I love her style. I love the way she pulls from historical uh, events, architecture, uh, decorative arts. I just, I love her style. Um, and I feel like she's documenting the moment in time, you know, the early, sort of early American culture uh, that goes really well with the primitive style of hooking. Not tons of detail, very folky, very naive looking, no effort to, to create sort of perspective or um, proportion. Right. Everything can be way off. It's just very, very folky, really, really beautiful. Um, I just love I love the mark she's put on that branch of rug cooking uh, with her life's work. It's really it, it's astonishingly great. Number 31 across. This is a verb. OK, this is a verb that means to fluff up your wool to make it more substantial, right, to make it more dense. When you're fluffing up your wool, you don't want to felt it, right? You don't want to boil it. You don't want to felt it. You don't want a Talbot's felted jacket because it's going to be hard to hook with. You want to make it just a little bit more full. And the word is full. So the answer is full. This is a verb. Let me just make sure that's, I put full and not fulling. What was that? 31 across... Full. Okay, good. Full. Just want to be sure I'm using the right tenses of the words as I give the answers. Um, you are there right now. You are there right now. Oh, in the print, you are big into primitives. You re you are, aren't you? And you're moving so fast, Melissa, doing your primitives, which is, I, I'm just so inspired by everything you're doing right now. And every time I look, you've got a new project going, which I love. But yeah, you are, you are working like it's 1860. And there's nothing I like more than that, right? Um, yeah, Jude, my buddy Judy Taylor said to me the other day, she said, you know, 
um, never feel bad, you know, but you, you work very differently than other rug hookers, right? There's always, I'm not going to say divide, but there's always a very a huge difference between the way that I work and the things that I like as a rug hooker. Um, and things that other people traditionally have liked in the 20th century. And she said, you know, a lot of people are working like it's, you know, still 1960, but you're working like it's 1860. And I said, you know, you're right. And, and you too, Melissa, you are working in that great primitive style where you're like just just moving fast. And it's all about impressions and capturing impressions and choosing the right color and having it fit. And it's just such a feeling. Um, I hope that you've had this feeling. I hope that all of you have had this feeling. As you're choosing colors and putting stuff together, sometimes when it's right, because it's not always right. And to be honest, for me, it's not usually right. But once in a blue moon, it's right. And it just comes together. And it's almost like a cartoon where there's like, I just feel like there's this swirl of color and motion around me. And, and it's, 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 it's landing in my piece that I'm hooking and it's making everything fit. Like I'm just here, here's a little bit of pink and I hook that in and it's like whoosh, spirals in and it goes in the whole thing starts to glow and it's almost like a supernatural event when it's all coming. That's what I live for when it's all coming together. And um, when projects work like that, when you're working, you know, quickly and you're just kind of pulling pieces very organically as you go, um, when it comes together, it is, it's, it's magic. You know, it's, it, you can't describe it. It's not like anything else. Maybe it's like being a painter, you know, and that bum, 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 bum. And then suddenly you go, Oh, the way that the light is coming in now, the whole thing makes sense. Maybe it's like that. I've never been a fine artist, right? I've always been a graphic artist. So I don't know that feeling as, as a painter, but I bet that that happens to people in a lot of, that, who work in a lot of different kinds of mediums. But the point is, you know, a lot of people feel that primitive is like um, beginner, right? Like it's like it's it's easy, right? Because it's like wide strips and there's not a lot of detail and it's like it's good for beginners. It's a whole style, right? It's a whole style to get primitive right is just as hard as getting a very technical piece that is hooked in a very fine cut, right? It's just a different style. It's apples and oranges. They can equally both go awry in a spectacular way. Um, but yeah, I feel like, I feel like primitive doesn't get its due. I really do. I've always, you know, I've always felt like that. Always on a bit of a crusade. All right, let's see. So the verb, oh, okay. The verb, um, is full. So let me show, I had a couple of images for full and so this is one of them. So this image, um, is not a full sweater. This is a felted sweater. So if, if you're trying to full and your sweater comes out like this, you've made it too hot and it shrunk and all the fibers are interlocking and they're grabbing at each other and it is, uh, your goose is cooked, right? It, you can use it um, maybe for applique, um, but for hooking, it's going to be very, very hard to use because it's too, it's too thick at this point, right? With, when this happens, you can cut up your sweater and hook it into latch hook backing. It'll be perfect for latch hook backing. But this is actually beyond full. Full is just a little bit more dense and, and literally fuller. But when you go too much heat, too much hot water, um, it felts. And then it isn't great for hooking. So in this case, um, th these were from a, a blog called, I think, Nanny's or Nana's blog, blog site. Um, she's showing you her, uh, she was doing some felting projects and she's going to make some wreaths. So you can see the, sorry, if you can hear Teddy, the red piece looks like boiled wool to me. That's not something that I would want to hook with, right? That's really thick and unforgiving, but the little piece in front, that's fair aisle. To me, that looks like something I could still hook with. I mean, I, I don't know. What do you think that I would, I would cut that even though it's a small little cuff, I'd cut it and I'd use a few pieces and I'd fill some little thing in. Um, but I think that'd be beautiful to hook with, but do you see that there is a difference between the red piece and the other piece? E even though this isn't a great photograph and you can't hold them in your hand, um, making wool sweaters too hot, but literally boiling them is going to felt them. And maybe that's what you want to do. You could needle felt a piece on top of it, or you can cut them up and use them for latch, latch backing. But um, you don't want things that tight and dense, or they're not handy for us as rug hookers in traditional rug hooking backings. So, all right. So the answer to that was full. Let's keep going. Um, 
Okay, this is, there's lots of different weights of yarn. This is one I talk about a lot. This lightweight yarn is great for punch, traditional punch, and mini punch, and it's even great for hooking, right? Oh, I wish I had it. I wish I could bring it upstairs. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to write downstairs and, pl and say, hold on one second. Please bring up, um, let's see. Please bring up my Jane Austen piece on the frame down there. I was working uh, with this kind of yarn that is the answer to this clue. It is a lightweight yarn. Um, I've been working with this, doing a Jane Austen piece, getting ready for our month, our British Christmas month of December. I think I have, I restocked the advent calendars and now I think I have, um, I think I have seven left. So if you haven't ordered one, you should really order one. This is going to be a great, thank you. Yeah, I got it. This is going to be a great month. There's in the advent calendar, it's, it's most, it's luxury, right? I keep saying, cause I want to make the point. Um, it's a lot of yarn, wool, um, it's several different paisleys. Um, it's mohair. It's nice. It's nice stuff. Cause I'm thinking of the, the sort of luxury era. Yes, Melanie, it is sock yarn. And let me just show you this. I'm working on this. Let me get my little needle minder off here. And let me see if I can hold her up. This is all sock yarn so far. So, well, actually, no, it's not all sock yarn. I'll show you closer up. Um, I was working on this. I, I stopped because I need to add some more colors. I didn't like, I felt like it was too monochromatic and I need to add at least two or three crazy pinks because it's, I got to do the pinks. One of them is going to be like a bluish raspberry. One of them is going to be like a watermelon and one of them is going to be like a carnation pink. But the center is done um, with black pantyhose, all black pantyhose for Jane's silhouette. And the rest of it, if you can see, that's all sock yarn. You see all the white surrounding her? Oh, the green is not sock yarn. That's my um, three ply Briggs and Little. But the white background is all sock yarn. And then I've got some bits, um, like this bit here. You probably can't tell on the camera, but it's mohair. It's much more fluffy than the rest. We're not getting a really good uh, image of it, but I'm loving it. And I'm putting in the text, thanks, Carol, um, one, of, one of Jane's great quotes, time will explain. Everything will become clear. Time will explain. So, yeah, so I'm working on this like crazy, and I'm, I'm going to finish it, the background with the sock yarn. But I am um, quadruple plying it. I'm not just putting it in half and hooking with it. I am. I have got four, um, um, four pieces next to each other, all folded up, right? I've got four ply of the sock yarn because it's so thin. But what I like about it is it. This one is speckled, and it's just. Can you see all the little speckles on it in the background? It it really for me it really adds to it, right? It's very. Um, Sock yarns are so pretty, and if you knit, you already know this, but sometimes if you order a yarn and, and they're like, do you want it? You want it like sock or a fingering weight, or do you want it like worsted weight or DK weight? If you choose worsted or DK weight, it's never as pretty as the sock or fingering weight. It's just never is. So I tend to get the sock or fingering weight because I know I can put it right through my mini punch or I can uh, double it, triple it, quadruple it up and either hook with it or punch with it. Uh, these are just two examples of sock yarns. These aren't even ones that I have. And 24 is a good price for sock yarn, I have to say. But yeah, I, I just can't get enough. If you already have it because you were hoarding it, um, get it out for your hooking. It's, it's remarkable how much fun. You have to pull it a little bit extra high than you would any other fiber because it's so thin and typically slippery. So, you know, you just pull it a little bit extra high, particularly if it's in the background, um, because it does, it does want to relax and, and sit low. It wants to sit low. You'll see what I mean when you start hooking with it, but it is a lot of fun. Gosh. Um, okay. Last one across. I have got to speed up. Oh no, that was the last one across. Let's let's now look at downs. All right, so filling it in well and good. Maybe while my mouth runs, you're looking at your blank spots where you didn't and you're going, oh, now I have lots of clues, lots of letters to connect. Oh, I just love crosswords. You love crosswords. I just love them. 
So let's start with down. This number one, this type of spindle is held in the hand and resembles a top. I'm going to show you what it looks like because that's not going to give away what the answer is. And you can see it's a four letter word. Not a baddie. Wait a minute, let's see. There we go. All right. This is a drop spindle. So the answer is drop. And I just showed on Coffee Time not that long ago. I bought a beautiful one at the Fiber Fest that I really loved. And I'm going to be using it with my roving and making some pretty stuff that I can hook with for some future Halloween projects. I have a lot of Halloween colored bat. So the answer for this is drop. These are drop spindles and to be continued on the drop spindle conversations because this is something I'm going to go into in more detail as I learn to do it myself. I'll take you with me. I know many of you do it already. Um, oh, sh oh, Carol, we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. And you can watch the rest of it later on maybe. Um, yeah, we'll look at this. I know a lot of you do this already, so maybe you can be giving me some tips, but it seems like a nice, good job, Melanie. It seems like a nice, um, easy, relaxing, very tactile and meditative um, way of creating yarn that you can easily use for hooking, just as it is, right? So let's go to number two down. Two down, early 20th century rug designer Helen Albee is associated with this state. So this is going to be a, the name of an American state, a U.S. state. Um, and the reason I didn't say is from is because this is where she had her vacation home and where she ended up settling and having her sort of mission, her rug hooking mission, the Abenaki rugs. Um, the state is New Hampshire. So this is just a pretty picture. I'm not sure what town this is. Could be so many towns. Absolutely good. Good job, Anne. That's your state. Um, yeah. Absolutely beautiful state, beautiful story. We talk about her quite a bit because she is she's one of these beloved rug hookers who taught so many women in the 19 zeros between 1900 and like 1910. That was her heyday. So, uh, okay, so here comes your next question. This is the best way in cooler climates to clean your hooked rugs. What do you clean your hooked rugs with in cooler climates? I bet you know. Let's come down here and I've got a lot of slides here. Snow. Snow, it won't be long until we'll all be there with snow. You know that song from, um, what is it? Not White Christmas. White Christmas. Yeah, no, it is White Christmas, isn't it? It was No, it was Holiday Inn. It was Holiday Inn. Remember Holiday Inn had some um, naughty songs in it, and then they remade it into White Christmas with the really bad offensive parts out of it? I'm not sure if they brought snow into White Christmas, but it was certainly in Holiday Inn. What a beautiful, what a beautiful song that was. That's one of my all-time faves. But yeah, you can just take a handful of snow and rub it on the surface of your rug because... If your rug is dirty, it's dirty on the surface. It's not dirty in between the loops because, you know, the dirt isn't getting in between the loops. You're walking, you're standing, dust is dust and dirt is landing on the surface of it. It's not burrowing down, right? It's just sitting there and being ground in. So if you're just cleaning the surface of it, that's enough. That's absolutely enough. And snow is a great way to do that. So it's not getting super saturated and, and soaking wet, like you're spraying it with a hose right? But if you live somewhere where it snows, right? be praying for snow this year. We didn't get hardly any in New England last year. I'd love to see a little bit this year. And God knows I have some rugs to clean with snow. So let's move to uh, number six down, Canadian hooker Elizabeth Blank. Is that your favorite movie? Uh, we were going to watch it this weekend, but we but we were saving it for a little bit further along. This week, I love that movie. This weekend, I love I love both Holiday and, and uh, White Christmas. This weekend, we watched Meet Me in St. Louis, uh, which is great because it goes through the whole year, right? It's not just a Christmas movie. It has a great holiday scene, uh, the Halloween scene too. Um, and we watched the shop, around the, the shop Around the Corner with Jimmy Stewart, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. It, it is uh, set at Christmas. It's really, it's set in, I think... Um, Oh, God. It's, I mean, they're all Americans, but it's supposed to be set in Eastern Europe. I forget where the setting was, but
but it's unexpected, but it's Jimmy Stewart. And it's, um, it's just fantastic if you haven't seen it. Highly recommend. It's the basis for the musical She Loves Me, and it's also the basis for um, the movie You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks and uh, Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan? Gosh, I haven't said her name in ages. Um, it's the basis for both of those. So that was very, very good. And then, then we stayed up late and I watched uh, for the first time ever. I can't believe I've never seen The Apartment with Jack Lemmon. Um, I mean, Shirley MacLaine is one of my favorite actresses of all time. I, I love her in The Trouble with Harry, right? Her first movie. But man, I loved The Apartment. I, that's like jumped right into my top three movies of all time. It was so naughty, but it was so good. It was dark. It was heavy. It was funny. And um, I have to say, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that, that Jack Lemmon was handsome and amazing. I, like my guy has always been John Forsyth, but man, now that I've seen Jack Lemon, holy mackerel! I I was so excited. I tried to stay up for another movie to watch Irma Laduce, um, also with uh, Shirley MacLaine and Jack Lemon, but I just couldn't. I made it about thirty seconds into the movie, but yeah, share your favorite movies with me too because I love, it's particularly if you like like older movies. I love finding great older movies that I have forgotten about. Judy says, I was taught to put the rug face down in the snow and walk on the back. Okay, that sounds great. Just it's it's exactly how you would be using it, right? Just walking on the surface of it, except you're doing it from the back and letting the snow do its crunchy job and cleaning things up a little bit. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because it is the same motion, the walking on it. That makes perfect sense. All right, let's see. Um, okay, so number six down, Canadian hooker Elizabeth Blank was known for her epic scale biblical scenes as well as portraits of American presidents and a lot of other things, right? Those are like the two really big categories of work that are, are iconic um, and, and very, very unique. Um, she did a lot of work. Her name was uh, Elizabeth Lefort, L-E-F-O-R-T. Uh, and I found this picture of her on the internet that I had not seen before. She also had the distinction of being, as far as we know, the fastest hooker of all time. Um, I, I can't remember how many loops a minute she could pull up, but it was in the many hundreds. It was like an astonishing number. And that's why she was able to, um, you know, do so many large pieces. I mean, this is just a moment of time. She's got a piece of burlap and she's, she's drawing right out to the edges She's actually drawing using one of those, it looks like a slide box, doesn't it? Where you put the slide in. Um, oh God, Eloise, any remake of A Christmas Carol, you're not kidding. Any remake. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start. My favorite is the Albert Finney version, Scrooge, the musical version. It's so good. And it's actually being staged uh, in Massachusetts in Fall River. And I as soon as I found out about it, it was already sold out. Uh, but they put me on the wait list because I thought I, I've seen it in London, um, the staged version of Scrooge. And it's so beautiful. This that, you know, the scenes where um, the ghost of Christmas present, right, the Bacchus type figure. Um, I love life. Life loves me. That character, he opens his coat and there's like the two children under it that are like want and abandon or something, something like that, you know, like horribly depressing but then there are characters flying over the audience and oh my god it's it was just absolutely amazing um alistair sims oh i don't know that one. Oh, interesting let me write that down right now alistair sims um my mom always watches one of the really heavy versions of it what would that be where she always goes i want to watch the one with mm, and it's a black and white version um it's not Alistair Sims. Um, oh, who is it? Come on. It's like it's like a classic. But for her, it's not Christmas until she's seen that version of it. Oh, I just lo I love it also. I love it. I love the story. So Elizabeth Lafort, L-E-F-O-R-T. You know, I think, I, I'm guessing what she's doing here, because she's drawing sideways. I'm wondering if she... If she was the kind of draw, have you ever experimented with that book, like drawing from the left side of your brain or something? It's not what it's, it's called, something like that, right? And 
um, it teaches you to look ignorance. Yep, that was definitely ignorance. And what was the other one? It teaches you to put down the lines, um, literally, and it doesn't allow you when you're holding something upside down or sideways, it doesn't allow your brain and unless you're an exceptional kind of a brain by far, most people, if you are looking at something the wrong way around, you are drawing it way differently than you would be if you were doing it right side up. Because if you were doing it right side up, you would be sort of employing all of the shapes that you presume go into it, right? That might not actually, but you've always done it that way kind of a thing. So I think what she might be doing is have her thing tipped on the table here. She's not even concerned about the gaps in the wood, right? I just love this photo because she's working so organically. And I picture her as such a technical person. She's sitting in front of a log cabin with a very pretty sleeveless blouse, looking sideways into a slide viewer and drawing sideways onto a burlap backing with absolutely no border to speak of. I mean, this is just like, this is so not what, I don't know, how I picture Elizabeth Lafort. Want. Thank you, Melissa. Ignorance and, uh, ignorance and want. Um, so good. So good. But yeah, this is my new favorite picture of Elizabeth. We've seen pictures like this a lot where, you know, we're seeing the crucifixion. Uh, you know, she does all of these scenes. This is the scale. It's, it's epic, literally epic. Um, but so colorful and so beautiful. I typically don't go for this kind of work myself. But I mean, for me at this point, I know that she is rug hooking with yarn, but at the same time, this feels like a tapestry to me because of the scale, right? And then, then we hit that weird blurry line, like it doesn't matter if it's done with a hook or um, a needle, it doesn't at all. Um, because in the end, you get something with this extraordinary amount of detail. So her work looks like this. It's, it's absolutely bewildering. Um, how many pieces of, of this kind of scale she did in her lifetime. Um, absolutely amazing. So if you want to go down a rabbit hole and you haven't heard of her before, Elizabeth Lafort, L-E-F-O-R-T. She's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So let's do our next question. Thought someone was creeping up behind me there. Uh, number eight down. Okay, these made handy, durable uh, sources for rug backings. So if you could get a hold of one of these back in the day, you could use it for your rug backing, right? They're very handy because if you lived on a farm or if you had a store near you and you could say, save me the last feed sack, the answer is feed sack. Melissa says, I visited her, her museum in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia years ago. I would like to go there. It's not my style of hooking at all, but the way, something about her, she brings something different than just technically great hooking. She really brings something different. There's like, it's, there's a really, um, um, what word am I looking for? Uh, there's such a strong need in her to, to do storytelling. And it, all of the, I mean, thinking back just to the crucifixion, the colors of the people's clothing, they're each distinct, they're each different, they each have personality, they each have like a really um, different expression. Like her, her desire to tell stories with these epic pieces, uh, epic sized pieces was really incredible. It added a layer of magic to pieces that otherwise could have just looked like tapestry, not just tapestries, but you know, we've seen, we've seen tapestries, we've seen stuff this size, but her work was really different. Um, painterly, that's a great word for it, painterly. And Anne, you are right, feed sacks is it. We all know what feed sacks looks like, uh, look like, but let me show you anyway. Uh, feed sacks are like, um, you know, the 1920s feed sacks are different, right? Because that's when companies during the depression years were printing them with pretty cheerful colors so that people could use them for quilting projects, right? So those are also feed sacks, but the feed sacks we're talking about are the ones that were made of burlap. So that you could just separate, the if it, if it was sewn front to back, you could separate it however, or you could separate it at the seam just on the bottom, right? And open it up the long way because that could work really well. Oh, go Colorado, it is Colorado potatoes, the blue goose potatoes. I have this bag too, really pretty. Um, yeah, you could open it just at that bottom seam 
and it would be pretty much hearth size because a hearth is so much wider a whole cooking hearth right with all all of the parts to it right is so much wider than like a, a modern or even like a 19th century fireplace hearth so this would be a great size opening this up the long way you'd have instant hearth rug ready to go right Melissa says yes and she did well-known people and sent them to the Queen Prime Ministers etc the museum has thank you notes from all the famous people displayed that's really cool she did like all of the presidents of that generation too and even like Jackie Kennedy I mean she it was it's just incredible and, and it's uncanny how much her work looks like her the subject right because it, it things can go awry you know when you're doing someone's face in textile um, it can easily go awry, but man, she was, it was like photographic. It was more than photographic, right? Because I'm not a huge fan of realism in rugs for myself. But what she did, it was like, it, it was, she added something. She added something more. Because um, that's always my thing. When I struggle with the technical part of hooking because it's, it's not interesting to me to recreate something that looks exactly like something else. Um, for me, that's, that doesn't feel creative. But... I mean, she's doing very technical work, but she she's adding something um, because you look at, you know, um, Eisenhower was one of the famous ones that she did. And she just adds a little more humor to his face. He, it's it's uncanny. It's so interesting. I, when I come up, I have got to go and check that out, too, because um, I think that it, I would never think that I would love this work, but I really do. I really do. If not love design wise, like I really admire her work and. The way that she worked um, is just remarkable, different, you know. All right, let's move on to... Ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. Okay, let's move on to 12 down. 12 down, and let me come back to you. Amish Blank is a rug form, a rug making form, that involves an oversized flat needle tool. So the reason I said needle tool is because it has a hole, right? It has a hole and a little bit of a point on the other side to pull through. I have got to do a video on um, Amish toothbrush. I have got to because um, I've taught it a lot and I recorded a video once and I screwed up some technical parts of the video where some of it didn't record and I couldn't figure out where and it turned into an absolute pig's breakfast and I ended up just deleting it all because... It, it took so much um, to try to figure it out. I thought I'm better off just starting from scratch. And um, that was a while ago. And I am better at recording now. So I'm going to record it again because it is a lot of fun. We're talking about Amish toothbrush. So the word is toothbrush. And let me show you some slides from here from Amish toothbrush. Um, for those of you who have the, the Jane Austen advent calendar, you might be seeing something that looks like bit like an Amish toothbrush because yeah anticipating recording a video might be something we want to do together so a finished rug and Amish toothbrush can look like this this is very bright colors can be done um you know with bed sheets with like cotton just Kona cotton poly blend you know the stuff at Joann's that's 250 a yard when you have the coupon um it doesn't have to be done in fancy schmancies if you do it in cotton prints you're going to have a lot of white because you know, most cottons are printed on one side, not the other. But it is a super fun, extremely fast craft. It's a proper rag craft. So this is my hand um, doing it with these colors because, I, again, I taught this for a while. And I was using orange as a runner underneath, right? And then I was adding, like, a lot of pastel colors. Uh, I had a color plan here as I went around. And uh, I was having a very good fashion day on this particular day. I must have put that gray nail polish on. Uh, just for the right look. I hardly ever am this together. But um, yeah, this is the Amish toothbrush I'm holding in my hand. And the reason, so this is the one that I had manufactured by one of our neighbors here um, who does like, he does the 3D printing and the laser cutting and he's got all kinds of machines over there. But it basically looks like the tool I was holding um, the reason it's called Amish toothbrush is because the first instances of it being done were very early 20th century and people would actually take an old toothbrush, cut it off and, you know, make a small point, not a sharp point, because then you're going to rip every time you poke it through somewhere, you're going to rip through your material. So very, very dull point. But the side of the toothbrush, because remember they used to have holes to hang 
that was there was already a hole there so you would put your fabric through that hole and drag it like a needle through right it doesn't work like a needle because it's very very dull but um, I like the one that I had made I made a lot of prototypes for it before he started making this for me because sometimes they're too thick sometimes they're too wide this it's like the three bears for me this one is just right so again if you have the Jane Austen advent calendar spoiler alert you might be seeing that tool because I have a plan to do something together if you like um, during December with the Amish toothbrush. I thought that could be fun, fun and different. So, all right, so let's keep going. Um, number 13 down. This style of hooking is haphazard and hopeful. Oh, that's tricky, isn't it? I'm sure you know, I'm sure you know what I was getting at here. Um, haphazard and hopeful. You hope it's going to be a hit, a hit, uh, but it might be a miss. It's called hit or miss. The answer is hit or miss. You always hope it's going to be a hit, right? You're just reaching into your grab bag and you grab the next color and you hook it in and you hope for the best. And this is an example of a hit or miss. Of course, the border of it has more of a color plan because there's more blue and white, but you can see there are still other colors in the border. So hit or miss rugs have no uh, sort of pre-planned color uh, planning happening, right? You're just taking your scraps, your left to over bits, and you're filling in your textile in a very haphazard way. Um, can be like that, like very haphazard, or it can be geometric haphazard, right? You've got lots of shapes going, but there is still no color planned. You've got your bags of loop noodles that are left over. I like that too, Kirsten. I know you, you meant the one before. Um, I like this one too. This one is actually done by Loretta Bartlett. So this is one of the only rugs that I can attribute tonight. Uh, just because the others just weren't um, um, noted at all. But geometrics can just as easily be hit or miss rugs, right? Because we're not talking about uh, uh, figural type stuff. We're not talking about a horse that you decided to do, oh, I'm going to do it hit or miss. I'm going to make the horse blue. That's not really how hit or miss works, right? I mean, that's color planning. If you're like, I'm going to make the horse blue. Hit or miss is when you're just grabbing at a color, um, without having any, you know, and, and there is kind of fudged hit or miss, right? This is what most of us, I think, do. You're, you have a bag of colors and maybe there's a hundred different scraps or noodles in there and, you, and you're going to use uh, a whole bunch of them. But when you reach in, you know you already did some with the dark, so now you really want a light one. So it's like fudged hit or miss because it's like, well, I'm reaching and I'm going to grab one, but I'm kind of looking for a light one, you know? So that, that is a variety of hit or miss. That's the more realistic way of talking about hit or miss because most of us don't like blindfold ourselves like we're like pinning the tail on the donkey and just grabbing supplies out of our bag. We're kind of looking and being thoughtful. But the idea is you've got all these leftover schnoodle noodles and you're just going to hook them in. And you hope that as a color combination, it's going to be successful and then it would be a hit, wouldn't it? Okay, moving on to number 14 down. Oh my gosh, it's late. Uh, what was Edward Sands Frost's occupation? Are you signed up for the Frost and Frost class? I'm going to be working on that as soon as I finish the advent calendars. I'm going to hopefully get um, the Zoom stuff done maybe Wednesday and send out some stencil uh, ideas. I don't want to rush it because if it might be that I need a couple more days because the class isn't until not this Wednesday. Next Wednesday is the first class. I don't want to rush it because I want to have the stencils for the things we really need. But I am one person and I also have to get the advent calendars out and all of the Christmas Magdalena stuff out, the doodle totes and all that stuff and all the other orders that are in. So I'm moving as fast as I can. But I hope you're signed up for the Frost and Frost. Edward Sands Frost was the, the main tin peddler who made those beautiful early stencils, right, that we know as our first kind of commercial patterns for rug hooking. So the answer is tin peddler. And I even found a picture, not of him, there is in existence a picture of him as a young man, but I thought even better to use a picture of a tin peddler because it gives you an idea of what the wagon would look like. Man, these look like some rough times, huh? Whew, I don't know. I mean, it's very quaint, don't get me wrong, but would I want to change places with the woman in this photo? Probably not, probably not. Although who knows, she could be happy as a lark for all I know. Uh, it looks like a tough life though, doesn't it? I mean, he's obviously got lots of bits and pieces and compartments built into his wagon. He sits right up on the seat. He's even got more junk behind him. 
Um, so this is what a tin peddler looks like at this time, and that's what Edward Sands Frost did. We'll talk more about him in Frost and Frost, uh, not this coming Wednesday, but the following, and then that Sunday, the following Sunday. Um, Scandinavian knotted, this is a Scandinavian knotted rug form that is worked with a needle. So it's making knots with a needle. It is a rug form. It is on a cloth backing, but it is making knots with a needle and it is not latch hook. So I did a lot of videos. Um, I did a couple of videos, at least um, spring, summer, with uh, Melinda Bird of Bird Call Studio. And she is the expert, uh, the true expert of Rhea rugs. R-Y-A, the answer is Rhea. R-Y-A. Um, and yeah, check out if you're interested in this form. It is a lot of fun. This is another thing I want to look at in 2024 because I started my Rhea rug with Melinda and I picked out my colors from her and I just loved being near her. She's such a warm, knowledgeable, fun, funny person to be around. It was just a great start learning from her because she really is the person. It was her parents, I'm sorry, her grandparents who brought the craft to the United States. So Rhea Rugs, R-Y-A, and we will be talking more about these beauties without a doubt in the future. Good job. Melanie, you're good. You did a really good job filling it in. Um, okay, so number 18 down. This is a fancy word for using old junk and making nice new things. This is a very popular word right now. And this is something that we do too, particularly if you are a thrifty kind of a rug maker where you're using old scraps, you are... Um, let me make sure because there's quite a few words it could be. Let me check. This is 18 down. Hang on. 18 down. Where are you? Upcycle. Upcycle. Um, so hopefully you got that because repurpose is another word, but upcycle. So for example, somebody's using old galoshes that maybe don't fit anymore as planters. That's a version of upcycling. Uh, somebody's using uh, shelves of um, an old dresser as a, as, a, as a little garden, as a little sort of on your porch garden. What a great idea. These are examples of upcycling. Just like cutting up your cardigan sweater that doesn't fit anymore and hooking it into a rug. Upcycling. That's what we do too. And Eloise says, I wove a rear rug. Uh, no idea where it is now. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, I hope that I hope that it's still with you. They are so beautiful. Um, the really long pile, right? Oh, to, to be continued. I hope that it's somewhere where you can find it again. Okay, let's go to... Oh, gosh, I thought I messed up. Number 22 down. Grenfell rugs were famously made from this article of clothing. So... What's it going to be? The Grenfell, the famous Grenfell rug was made out of not this brand, but the answer is stockings. You know, I just, I never miss a chance to talk about legs, egg stockings. I mean, I just remember them in the grocery store and what a lot of fun it was. And I'm just loving this packaging because I remember this cinnamon, cinnamon stocking. I mean, how great was this? Oh, you will. Please look for it. Let me know if you find it, too, because you could send a picture and I could use it for gallery night. That would be really fun. Stockings. Grenfell rugs are famously made uh, with stockings. And yes, the call out was given to all the society women at that time. Send us your stockings, right? Because they would just throw them out and they do hook beautifully. My Jane Austen, right? The black part, the whole cameo part, the silhouette, all stockings that I've dyed. I, it is my number one favorite, personally, it is my number one favorite thing to hook with is stockings. Um, I just love them. They, they hook so well, and they're also extremely durable. So let's move to number 24 down. American artist Alexander Blank was known for his kinetic mo mobiles, 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 uh, mobiles, mobiles. My brain's not working. But also designed a number of rugs and needle points. And we are talking about, I'm going to have to blow again. Hang on. We are talking about the great Alexander Calder. C-A-L-D-E-R. Hold on, I'm going to blow my nose.
gosh, sorry about that. All right. Calder, C-A-L-D-E-R. Um, this is a Connecticut artist, too. I really, really love his work. Um, if you remember, I did an episode on Calder because he designed rugs. Uh, this is one of the rugs he designed. He designed a lot of hooked rugs, a lot of cut pile rugs like this one, um, and a lot of like raffia rugs that were more like woven rugs. Um, but there are at least at least two known hooked rugs, and it was interesting because he would design them, and um, his wife would start hooking them, and then the neighbors would come, and they would help um, sort of execute the designs for these kind of prototype rugs. And he didn't do a lot of rugs. But because so many neighbors and friends got in on the fun of hooking rugs of his designs, uh, it became difficult later to figure out uh, who actually hooked the designs, even though they're signed. And, you know, it's interesting. I'll have to talk about this at, at length on an episode of uh, Coffee Time. But I got an email. Was it Matthew? Um, somebody saw one of my shows and it was the Calder show. And he said, I just wanted to ask you, I think I found a, I, or I think I own an Alexander Calder hook drug. Can I run it by you and see what you think? And I said, absolutely. I'm pretty knowledgeable about Calder. So he sent a picture of it. And I thought two, two things immediately, like my heart was pounding. And immediately I thought, number one, it's not a hook drug. It's a needle point. But then I thought, but wait a minute, there's also hardly any Calder needle points. So I think he's still going to be really happy that this is a needle point, but it's just not a hook drug. So I wrote back to him at length and he sent a bunch of photos. I'll share those with you. Um, but yeah, it was super, super interesting because it, it was an image that I've never seen. And I kind of just double checked. I forget, maybe it was like 64, 1964, something like that. And I was thinking, I was thinking about Calder and like his images, like the kinds of work he did at that time. And then I kind of just checked myself before I answered and, and was looking, I mean, he was very into planetary shapes and solo shapes at that point. He was, it was very, very stark. It was just like his mobiles. And, um, and I said, you know, this is so like, this design is so it's signed his way in needlepoint. It's so consistent with his work. I'll have to show you the pictures. It was a very, it was a very exciting afternoon. I got that message while I was picking the kids up from school and I, I was, I just got frantic and excited uh, because it's, it's interesting whether it's a hook drug or a needle point, it's interesting when another um, fiber version of an Alexander Calder comes to light, you know, that is completely unknown. It's exciting. So I'll, we'll look more at that another time. It was super, super fun. Uh, thing to find that email. Well, I didn't find the rug. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I'd be locked up in bedlam because I would have lost my mind profoundly. Uh, okay, so moving on to number 25 down. This contemporary tool called a blank gun is popular now for creating large-scale yarn rugs. And I know you know this. And you might have an opinion on it. And in, in a small way, I do too, but I do have several tufting guns and I do have my giant frame set up. I have two giant frames. And as soon as I come up for air on quite a few fronts, I am going to start doing videos on it because yes, it is wildly aggressive. It can be controlled. Um, it moves very, very fast. And I'm going to be working on monk's cloth. You can also tuft into like burlap. You can tuft into burlap. Isn't that crazy? But I have got, I've got a huge piece of monk's cloth up on mine for a long time. And I have to, I was going to do like a version of a Helen Frankenthaler on there. And I just got too, too busy to be able to do that for my book project. But I still could because I cut her from this one and she's going into book number two. So um, I still could. But I want to show you this just so you know what it does. You know, I think one of the problems with the tufting gun is that people are using it to do a lot of like copyright infringement art. Like, you know, do a lot of like copyrighted characters and video game stuff and whatever. And, and we get that a little bit in rug hooking, but we definitely get that more in tufting because it's younger people who are tufting and using this tool. And, you know, they, they're tufting the things that they like, right? The pop culture that's around them. And while that's all well and good and copyright is a different conversation, I just want to see how far we can go with the idea of um, tufting at different heights. I have the looping tufting gun, right? I have, I have both. I have the clipped and the loop, but I'm going to be using the looping one because it's more like rug hooking. And I want to show you an experiment with the different heights so you really understand what this tool can do because it is a fun tool. It is fast and fun and, and you can control it 
like like learning to ride a horse and control the horse, right? You can't control the gun. It doesn't have to pull your arm out of the socket. Like you will figure it out sooner rather than later. I just want to show you what it can do um, because it's often considered like a lowbrow tool, a cheaty PD tool within the world of rug hooking, but we're still talking about rug making. And in theory, you know, with a monk's cloth backing, I could tuft part of it really fast, like in an afternoon and a huge, huge rug. And then I could hook or uh, traditional punch the rest of it. It's monk, it's regular monk's cloth. It's our monk's cloth, right? So lots of things. You could also, you could also uh, rug tuft, not just linen, but you could do rug warp. Um, and again, burlap, like basically any of our backings you could tuft into too. So I thought, um, yeah, more needs to be said on that subject. All right. So second to last question, number 26 down, author William Winthrop blank, William Winthrop Blank wrote three of the most important early books on rug making. And they were the, the hooked rug, um, design in the hooked rug or design for the hooked, no, hooked rug design. So the hooked rug, hooked rug designs, and I think maybe more hooked rug, something like that. I feel like it was something like that. Um, Kent is the answer. William Winthrop Kent. We've talked about him quite a bit over the years too. This is Kent as a young man, uh, such a dandy, such a well-educated dandy, such a great traveler. He was very interested in iron work too. So, you know, he definitely, um, if you have his books and you read his books, there is absolutely a tone to them. I don't like that tone. It's that, it's that kind of a tone, rare hook drugs. That's it. The hook drug, rare hook drugs and hook drug design. Um, these are very uh, lengthy books, beautifully done. The tone is a bit much, but very, very upper class narration, right? There's a voice, there's a voice to the, to the text. But what I will say is the, um, the text is absolutely riveting. It really is good. And the illustrations are extremely useful. And the rugs that he's turned up in black and white to show in this book are unbelievably beautiful. It does, the, the, if you just sit and look at these rugs, you're going to get lost in, in beauty and dreaming. They are so beautiful. He shows so many illustrations in his rugs. So I highly recommend the books. A lot of dated information because he's talking about how rug cooking started in Egypt and all this. But, you know, not really reading about the nonfiction part of it, but reading about um, his impressions of and what he knows about the rugs that he finds um, think that those parts are very interesting and very worthwhile and still quite meaningful. Last question of the night. This term, okay, this is tough. And where'd my socks go? Because now I'm freezing. This term for an, unwo for an unwoven end of warp thread or fringe, I'm sorry, it says fridge, but I meant fringe, um, also has a nautical association. So this term for an unwoven end of warp thread or fringe also has nautical associations. So it's a word that sailors have historically used too. It's a word that they used for where the sail of the ship um, is, I, I, I'm not a sailor, but I'm gonna say is strong and where it flaps against um, the poles, right? And creates so much violent flapping at sea that it could actually snap a pole they softened the many sailors um, softened the edge of the sail with this material and the word is let me see if i did plural or singular hold on what number is that 28 down singular thrum the word is thrum t-h-r-u-m so thrums are literally the parts on the sides of a weaving um, that get cut off Good job, Anne. That was a good. That was a tough one. And thrums were added um, on boats to the edges of sailors' uh, sails where they met the masts and things, so that they didn't beat, um, you know, the hell out of the beams and crack them on a boat. So thrums, thrumming, thrummers. These are words that came about uh, for people who use the edges, like the the extra, and. For us as rug hookers, though, so a lot of rug hooking groups are called thrummers, right? Because they're using leftover bits of yarn or fiber from weaving. So it's a reference to the leftover bits. 
Um, so a lot of rug hooking groups, instead of being called hookers or ruggers, they're called thrummers. And that fits perfectly well, too, into our language. It makes perfect English language sense. Um, the thing is, with thrums, right, there's so many stories about... Uh, well, for me here, Lowell, Massachusetts is like was one of the great mill towns that Lowell girl, like all these miserable kind of Hans Christian Andersen stories about girls work, working in mills. I'm not minimizing it. It was obviously a true, I know you are, Anne, you are my little matey. I know you love sailing on, on your sailboat. These girls had absolutely miserable lives, right? At beyond understatement, right? There's plenty of books on the subjects of mill girls, but one thing I'll say is there's also a lot of, st I'm not, I'm not excusing, but there's also a lot of stories about how at some mills, they would allow girls to keep the thrums. So in other words, they've been weaving all day, you know, for 18, 19 hours, right? They've hardly slept. They're sick. They're, you know, have consumption. They're still sitting up at a loom and weaving and it's, you know, seven days in a row because whatever. And there's a bunch of thrums on the floor from weaving, right? All the leftover bits get cut and thrown on the floor. There are, there were mills back in the day, like Industrial Revolution in America Day, that that they would allow the girls to like take home the thrums, and like, I mean, it, it's like a pittance, you know, in comparison to what the lifestyle was like. But in a very small way, it must have been like somewhat exciting if you worked somewhere where they let you take home a big bag of thrums. Because rag crafts, like hooked rugs, you know, sometimes we see hooked rugs in New England and they're made, and they're old, and they're made of so many different colors that we get into these conversations where it's like, God, I wonder how, who could have had that many colors? Who could have had that much clothing that they could have come up that, cut up that many colors to use in this one rug? Well, thrums. It was probably someone who had access to thrums and they had all of those colors to use in their work. So often the question, the answer to the question that we're asking, how did somebody have all these colors? Well, they didn't, but the factory where they worked or their sister worked did, and they brought home thrums. And they're, and then right into the rag bag, right? And then right out for hit or miss, filling in backgrounds. So th thrums is a big part, uh, are a big part of our rug cooking history. And it's a word that is hardly even known anymore, but it should be known better. And the Rhode Island group, who is no longer an Ather group, they're called the Little Rhodey Thrummers. So um, it's interest, just interesting if the word makes, it way, makes its way back into um, language in a more regular way than it has in the last 150 years. That would be interesting because it might be because rug cooking is also making a resurgence. And Eloise says, Thrummer also cut off and kept for other weavings, um, theory at least, to do like smaller, smaller pieces with the same materials, I guess. That would make a lot of sense. That would make a lot of sense. I would never want to be a mill girl, but I would love to time travel and just look into someone's little bag some night and go, oh my God, look at all this stuff that you took off the floor and you're going to go home and make a rug out of it. Exciting. All right. I am done. Stick a fork in me. I am done. And we are late to boot, but I really enjoy these nights that we do crossword puzzles together. I hope you got it all filled out. I hope I didn't make any mistakes while I was running through it. Uh, I am just not well. So I will not be with you tomorrow on Monday. I will be at work because I will be um, shipping out a ton of stuff. Um, the advent calendars, first of all. And um, and then I'll be back with you. Um, my plan is to be back with you on Wednesday and to be with you on Thursday morning, um, Thanksgiving morning here in the U.S. And I will be with you on Friday and also with Rebecca Martin of Storyteller World because we will be looking at her fabulous book. Um, so we've, we've got a lot coming up this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you're looking at the products that are out there. I have a bunch of things. I was a bit backed up. Um, I normally get stuff out in a week, two weeks tops. Um, but a few people, you included Anne, waited more than two weeks, which isn't usually my thing. I'm still a one person operation and I'm looking forward to leveling up. So hopefully in the new year, that's something that I can rely on, um, you know, making X amount and then definitely being able to level up and have somebody with me all the time who doesn't drive me crazy and does good work. That's the trick, isn't it? Thumbs up. Thank you. Yeah, it was educational for me too. It was a lot of fun. I love these, these crossword nights. I feel like we should do them every couple months at least. Um, I will sleep well. I don't even think I'm going to go back downstairs. 
even though I know there's spice cake down there with chocolate chips. I think I'm still going to stay up here and go to bed. So I will see you all soon. Have a great tomorrow. Remember, I will be back with you on Wednesday at noon for coffee time. You can be sending me your images for the next gallery night. It'll be not this coming Friday, but the following Friday. So it was fun. It was fun for me too. I will see you all soon. Look at the shop. See what's there. There's lots of great holiday stuff right, coming up. And remember, the Jane Austen month is coming up. Whether you think you like Jane Austen or not, it's more about the British Christmas and traditions. It's going to be a very festive month. Um, and like I said, I put the advent calendars back in stock. So be thinking about that. If you love velvet, paisley, um, wool, these kinds of rich, like um, early Victorian, this is Georgian period, not Victorian. But, you know, the, the robin's egg blues and the golds and the rich pinks and maroons, like that kind of color palette, that Georgian palette, this is going to be a great calendar for you and a lot of pretty luxury materials and a couple of tools. I told you about one tonight, but there's a second tool that's in this set that is going to be really fun. It's going to be very, very different. I will see you next time. Have a great tomorrow, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in, like, subscribe, all of that stuff, and I will see you soon, hopefully feeling a lot better. Take care.